In January of this year, Defense Secretary Dick Cheney canceled the Navy A-12 fighter aircraft program, citing project mismanagement and a billion-dollar cost overrun. McDonnell Douglas Corporation and General Dynamics Corporation were the joint holders of the A-12 contract and had up to that point received some $3 billion from the federal government, yet no planes were ever built. Following the project's cancellation, the Pentagon agreed to separate requests from the two contractors to defer collection of some $1.3 billion they owed the federal government for the A-12 program. In April, the Government Operations Committee was told by Department of Defense officials that a thorough financial analysis had been completed before the deferment of payment was granted. But after a lengthy investigation, some committee members are now questioning the thoroughness of that financial analysis and charging the Pentagon with making secret deals with two of the world's largest defense contractors at the expense of the American taxpayer. We now take you to the Rayburn House Office Building here on Capitol Hill for a hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security. The panel is chaired by Democratic Congressman John Conyers of Michigan. It met Wednesday to continue its investigation into the A-12 aircraft program and the government's efforts to recoup the money spent on the project. You will now see testimony from a number of witnesses, including representatives from the Department of Defense and the General Accounting Office. We now bring you Wednesday's proceedings. The Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security of Government Operations will come to order. Today we continue the investigation into the cancellation of the Navy A-12 attack aircraft and the subsequent deferment of $1.3 billion of funds due the government. Four issues. First, was there an adequate analysis performed by the Department of Defense before our officials gave the two large defense contractors the largest deferral of debt ever granted? Two, did the Department of Defense officials mislead Congress as to the nature of their analysis and does the Department have any constitutional basis for its continued refusal to release relevant documents. Three, is the Department of Defense granting McDonnell Douglas most favored contractor status through a series of sweetheart deals involving deferrals, loans, unusual progress payments, and advance payments on contracts? And finally, how many other deferrals have been granted by the Department of Defense and how many more are there going to be in the future? At the first hearing, the committee had to fight for relevant documents held by the Department of Defense. We were assured that the department had performed a very good analysis before granting the deferment one that they were proud of. We were told that it was essential to grant this deferment or else one or more of these contractors could have declared bankruptcy right at the, that point and we would have never gotten repaid. However, we found that there was no analysis performed. The contracting officer in charge of the analysis told committee investigative staff that it was more of a review than an analysis. We discovered that this review lasted all of one week from the time the contractors requested the deferral on January 24th to the time the recommendation was made to the deferral on January 30th. This review consisted almost entirely of information provided by McDonnell Douglas without any independent verification of this information. For example, by checking with the company's major creditor banks, a very basic uh, procedure. And this review did not follow the minimum requirements established by law, specifically 32 CFR section 163. We found that there was virtually no analysis of General Dynamics, the other partner, 
General Dynamics was granted a deferral simply because of their team agreement. And at the uh, April hearing, their officials testified that they never considered declaring bankruptcy with or without a deferment. We found that McDonnell Douglas explicitly told a Department of Defense official during her review that they would not go bankrupt. Far from bankruptcy, the two contractors are enjoying rising stock prices, are paying incredible bonuses to their executives, and a number of other things that don't suggest to me that they're in any trouble at all. One of them is so flush with funds that it's looking to buy other companies. Then we found something really extraordinary. At the same time, McDonnell Douglas was looking for a billion dollar deferment on the A-12 program. It was also requesting a loan for the Department of Defense for another billion dollars. Much of the information provided to the committee after April uh, the April hearing was not in reference to the deferment, but to this remarkable loan application by McDonnell Douglas. This loan request has been kept secret from the public, but no more. Because of its importance, I'm making it available to the public. The letter from the Chief Executive Officer of McDonnell Douglas to the Under Secretary of Defense. The people who have to pay for these billion dollar deals at least have a right to know what's being negotiated in their name. In another document the committee's releasing today, it appears that some $770 million may have been, was, who knows, funneled to McDonnell Douglas, as well as information possibly critical to the negotiations then underway on the C-17 aircraft program. We'll ask for an explanation of this extraordinary action. And we'll be looking at other deferments. Although the law provides that deferments are for small and financially weak contractors, we found that last year DOD granted deferments to Lockheed and Delco Electronics. Both are involved in defective pricing cases, which doesn't ring very well. Neither seems small or financially weak, and one is a wholly owned subsidiary of the General Motors Company. And to top everything off, the GAO has reviewed the last 10 years of deferments, could find no records whatsoever for deferments granted before three years ago. And so the committee's investigation has some important goals. We want to ensure that the money deferred by the Department of Defense may hopefully be returned to the Treasury. Maybe if we dare even soon return to the Treasury. We also want to expose this pattern of practice, this process of care and feeding of the big contractors in military procurement, clearly at the expense of our citizenry and others, uh, not to mention other uh, competing contractors. And finally, we're going to find a way to stop this backroom secret dealing in which the Pentagon too frequently does business. If these extraordinary efforts by the Department of Defense are as noble as they would have us believe, then let's make sure the deals are done out in the public where we can see what's being done with tax dollars. I'd like now to recognize the ranking member of this committee, Frank Horton, the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At some at a later period of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can mention it. You okay. Can read it. I am going to read it. Okay. Yeah, you can read it. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd like to commend you for continuing our hearings surrounding the cancellation of the Navy's A-12 air, airplane program. Although the topic of today's hearing is, is the deferment issue, I hope we do not forget that cancellation has set back Navy plans for a new attack aircraft at least a decade, meaning they will have to rely on the old A-6 whose designs can be traced back to the 1950s. The real tragedy surrounding the A-12 fiasco may be that existing rules and normal procedures were simply ignored. As we learned during our hearing in April, the problem was that proper oversight procedures were not followed by those responsible for the program. Then when it came time to consider the deferment, it appears that again proper and normal accounting procedures were once more simply ignored. A $1.3 billion deferment was given with little more than a cursory review of old financial reports rather than a proper and thorough analysis. And the more the staff looked into the deferment issue, the worse it gets. Apparently there are no records prior to 1988, which you uh, documented in your statement. In other words, if you are a defense contractor and owe the government some money, all you have to do is apply for a deferment, stall for about three years, and it will be lost in the system. I'd like to repeat the warning I gave in April. Every time I meet a general or admiral, they complain about congressional micromanagement, but the lessons from the A-12 so far is that without congressional oversight, the government would be losing billions of dollars. The actual amount is unknown since there are no adequate records. Mr. Chairman, that must be corrected, and that's, what, and that's not micromanagement. It's oversight, and that's what our responsibility is. We're looking out. Uh, for the taxpayer and for the s and watching the shrinking defense dollars. And so I um, am happy that you're having this hearing, and I'm sure we're going to get some very valuable information today. I thank you very much, Mr. Horton. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chris Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank you for conducting these hearings and to uh, thank the staffs on both sides who I think have done a superb job of preparing us for this hearing. Uh, I have to say um, that the longer I serve on this committee, the more I feel that the Department of Defense, DOD, and uh, the contractors who do business with DOD are, are one and the same. It seems to me, as I look at the evidence that we have here, some of which amazingly will not be made public, uh, that the more I look at information like this, it's almost like the motto of, of the Department of Defense is, we take care of our contractors. And I just can't help but, but ask the question at whose expense. We see uh, a deferral of $1.3 billion without much research, uh, which I view as an overpayment. And then we have seen documents that, that show a real effort on the part of the Department of Defense to provide uh, McDonnell Douglas with, with over $700 million. On the surface, very candidly, it looks like the Department of Defense and McDonnell Douglas have conspired to transfer billions of dollars uh, to McDonnell Douglas uh, to have it done without people being made aware of it. Uh, when, we, when we see evidence of this, to claim that the public does not have a right to know and is seeking to prevent this committee from making this information public. The losers are the taxpayers and very candidly I wonder uh, why the SEC has not stepped in uh, to, to consider whether the government and McDonnell Douglas have not, in fact, conspired to keep very valuable information away from investors who have the right to know about uh, the investments they make. And so I see this as not the final step in the hearing process, but the beginning. And ultimately, I think the public will be made aware of what they need to be made aware of, in spite of the reluctance of the Department of Defense and the companies uh, to have this be known. Thank the gentleman very much. <clears throat> Before we begin, I, I think it's only fair that the chair makes a comment about the release of, of uh, so-called alleged trade secrets or proprietary information. Following our last hearing uh, on the A-12 program, uh, we obtained Department of Defense documents concerning the A-12 deferral agreement and request by McDonnell Douglas for other financial assistance. One of these documents, a January 24, 1991 letter from McDonnell Douglas Chairman John McDonnell to the Department of Defense, 
requests an advance payment pool of a billion dollars. In correspondence to the subcommittee in the Department of Defense, McDonnell Douglas has asserted that this letter contains trade secrets and proprietary information that are protected from public release by a law, 18 U.S. Code 1905. The Department of Defense has taken the position that it will honor the company's assertion. Now, 18 U.S.C. 1905 is a criminal statute that generally prohibits government employees from disclosing trade secrets or confidential statistical data that have been provided by a corporation. By its terms, Section 1905 does not apply to the Congress, but only to an officer or an employee of the United States or any department or agency. Uh, the General Counsel of the House has confirmed that this provision of law applies only to the executive branch, not to members of Congress acting in their official capacity. At this hearing, uh, acting in my official capacity as chairman, I have full authority to release this information. In addition, in conducting this hearing, Members are engaged in core legislative activities that are fully protected by the speech or debate clause of the Constitution as recognized by the Supreme Court in the 1972 case of Gravel versus the United States. And as a matter of law, the chairman and the subcommittee, all its members, are thus fully authorized to release and to discuss publicly matters that relate to or contain trade secrets or proprietary information. Moreover, the January 1991 McDonnell letter does not, in fact, contain any trade secrets or proprietary information. Sensitive information is shielded to prevent a company from obtaining the secrets of its competitors and unfairly gaining an advantage in the marketplace. Nothing in the McDonnell letter would or could confer such an unfair advantage. There's no litmus test that defines trade secrets or proprietary information, particularly in the area of financial data. Indeed, some details of a corporation's financial positions are already matters of public record and are filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission and others, particularly detail financial forecasts or projections are not generally made public. The January 1991 90, McDonnell letter contains no detailed financial forecasts or projections concerning the company. This letter contains only the most generous statements about the company's financial position and the availability of commercial credit. Even when coupled with the request for an advance payment pool of a billion dollars, the letter's contents constitute neither trade secrets nor proprietary information. In repeated discussions with our staff, representatives of McDonnell Douglas have been unable to identify any proprietary data or trade secrets in the letter. Although they assert that the company's marking of the letter as proprietary precludes its disclosure. Not so. The Department of Defense General Counsel also could not identify any proprietary data or trade secrets in the letter. The mere use of a proprietary stamp does not convert a potentially embarrassing document into a protected trade secret. That protection is a very narrow one which does not apply to the January 1991 McDonnell letter. When anyone seeks a billion dollar loan from the United States government, the American people have a right to know about it. And as their elected representatives, we have a duty to ensure that such transactions are not hidden under a veil of unwarranted secrecy. And so I'd like now to uh, proceed with the hearing. We've got uh, the Honorable Frank Conahan before us from GAO, no stranger, been before the committee innumerable 
times and occasions as Assistant Comptroller General for National Security and International Affairs at the U.S. General Accounting Office. With him is, of course, Paul Math, Director of Research, Development, Acquisition, and Procurement. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. I want to give him the oath. Sure. Yeah, if you'll, uh, if you'll uh, stand, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Uh, your statement will be incorporated in its entirety in the record without objection, as will all of the other witnesses. Uh, welcome, Mr. Conahan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You asked us essentially to uh, comment on, uh, on three matters. You asked us to evaluate one the analysis performed before making the deferment decision, two, the data used in making that decision, and three, the reasonableness of the uh, deferment decision. First, uh, I will say that the uh, DOD analysis was undocumented as you uh, might expect it to be. Uh, the DOD officials that we spoke with throughout this evaluation say that they see its analysis as consisting of a deliberative process of meetings and a January 31, 1991 briefing to the services acquisition executives and controllers uh, and, and the controllers and that this supported their decision. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I would have expected uh, to find uh, better documentation uh, associated with this uh, exercise. I think that the department uh, would have some difficulty and, of course, has had some difficulty in demonstrating that it is properly exercising its fiduciary responsibilities. Now, I will talk about the substance and the merit of the case itself a little later on, but I think that this in and of itself is an important matter and that uh, we need to uh, uh, think about it uh, as, as we go through this series of hearings. And I don't really have much more to say about that. So let me talk about the data. Uh, that was available for uh, DOD's analysis and DOD's deliberative process as we saw it in going through uh, our, uh, our own analysis. As you mentioned, because McDonnell Douglas's financial condition was believed to be weaker than General Dynamics, DOD limited uh, its attention to, uh, to McDonnell Douglas. What I would like to do is to cite uh, a number of um, events and uh, information uh, over the uh, period from the summer of 1990 uh, until the decision was made to uh, give a, uh, an indication of the kind of uh, deliberative process that was uh, undertaken and the kind of information that was available. Beginning in August 1990, the uh, administrative contracting officer at the corporation alerted DOD officials to McDonnell Douglas's weakened financial condition. Uh, that same office uh, in uh, August and then later in September described a series of actions McDonnell Douglas had taken to conserve cash, improve credit arrangements, and strengthen its financial position. The memos indicated that McDonnell Douglas' debt uh, had been downgraded. The Defense Contract Audit Agency in September stated in its uh, report that the then current financial capability of McDonnell Douglas was weak when compared with industry standards. Beginning about that time, there were numerous meetings uh, within uh, the Department of Defense concerning McDonnell Douglas's financial condition. Uh, the Air Force at that time uh, was doing analysis of the C-17 program. They were taking a look at the McDonnell Douglas's cash flow position. Uh, that analysis and that information was presented to the people uh, who ultimately uh, were involved in the decision to uh, take the uh, deferment uh, action. On January 16th, uh, McDonnell Douglas provided financial information uh, to the Navy. Uh, later on, uh, or at about the same time, McDonnell Douglas gave the uh, corporate uh, uh, contracting officer uh, its uh, debt forecast. It showed McDonnell Douglas would be in a negative cash flow position in uh, 1991. Finally, on uh, January 24th, uh, in connection with this letter that you have up on the board, Mr. Chairman, requesting an advance of uh, $1 billion, uh, the CEO submitted uh, a financial uh, package. And in late January, additional information was obtained uh, and received. Finally, uh, the Director for Defense Procurement briefed the service acquisition executives and the controllers on January 31. And the tentative conclusions uh, reached and presented by the Director at that time were 
that McDonnell Douglas bankruptcy uh, would not be in DOD's best interest. Uh, McDonnell Douglas could not afford to repay the A-12 debt. McDonnell Douglas needed additional short-term financing. And McDonnell Douglas's financial problems would be a continuing concern. You ask that we comment on the reasonableness of the uh, DOD deferment decision. As I said uh, at the outset, I think that uh, the Department uh, has had, will continue to have difficulty in demonstrating that it met its fiduciary responsibilities with respect to this transaction because of the way it went about uh, this whole matter and uh, the absence of, uh, of documentation. But in our own analysis, we found a, a great deal of, uh, of pertinent information. And uh, in the final analysis, based on that information, uh, I don't think we can conclude that uh, the Department's decision was unreasonable. And I'd like to cite uh, some uh, of the uh, reasons for that. And it starts, again, going back to the uh, fall time frame, uh, the DCAA uh, September 1990 audit report, which contained the financial status indicators suggesting that McDonnell Douglas was in a weakened financial position. It showed the declining debt ratios, and they were substantial declining uh, debt uh, ratios. Uh, we subsequently see uh, negative cash flow information and some pretty good projections whether you use McDonnell Douglas's data or whether you use data uh, that was uh, modified by the Department of Defense. I think you clearly see uh, uh, negative cash flow positions going out into uh, 1991. Uh, there was uh, representations on the part of McDonnell Douglas that uh, its banks uh, would have difficulty in continuing to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, we don't have direct verification of that, but uh, inasmuch as uh, Standards and Poor's and Moody's uh, had uh, uh, downgraded uh, the McDonald's position twice during that period of time, that's, uh, that's further uh, uh, indication. Uh, there is more uh, information that came out in uh, late January on uh, the company's negative uh, cash flow. Uh, we saw, indeed, that uh, the company had uh, undertaken uh, a number of initiatives to respond to its weakened financial condition. It had initiated uh, cost redu reduction initiatives and cash con uh, conservation initiatives. These were in response to its own uh, assessment. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in connection with uh, the analysis associated with uh, uh, the C-17, uh, we found uh, uh, that the government had available to it additional information that uh, showed the financial condition of, uh, of the company. There were a few other considerations that uh, we thought were pertinent that uh, uh, various uh, folks in the department uh, took into account. And that was that uh, the uh, company uh, was responsible for uh, developing and producing a number uh, of weapon systems. And if uh, the company uh, went under, it would uh, adversely affect uh, uh, performance there. That uh, the loss of this contractor uh, could adversely affect the U.S. defense industrial base uh, overall. It's an important uh, contractor. And then finally, the uh, Persian Gulf uh, War was ongoing at that time, and the department was relying on the continued support of, uh, of that company. Then there are the financial uh, um, um, situation with respect to the appeal itself. That the uh, contractor team uh, disputed the amount owed. Uh, has filed its appeal, although it hadn't filed at that time. Uh, and if the court rules in favor of the team, uh, it will not have to repay uh, the deferred uh, amount. That was a consideration and uh, covered uh, in the body of regulation in making these kinds of decisions. Uh, that concludes uh, my summary, Mr. Chairman. We'll be willing to take uh, any questions that you may have. Well, <clears throat> I don't have I don't have many questions, uh, but I am very troubled. Uh, I had a, a difficult time with your statement. You gave us a lot of advice about the war and the, the, the nature of uh, the contracting industry, uh, which apparently you took into account. But how was it generally known and how could it be stated that over a billion dollars, uh, the loan over a billion dollars, because they believed that that something was generally known. In other words, how, how much independent investigation did you get into? 
uh, you're supposed to be dealing with the facts. Did you verify anything about the, uh, the Department of Defense or McDonnell Douglas, uh, what they said uh, regarding uh, the availability of credit or the change in the cash flow due to the A-12 cancellation or the su suspected cash flow required by the $1 billion IRS debt or, or any other statement? I mean, how, how did you conduct your investigation? What, what we have is that, uh, that uh, uh, GAO, uh, is, you're told by DOD, who's told by McDonnell Douglas, who's told by their banks, that it might affect their credit line. And uh, how, do we, how do we get some independent confirmation in here? Insofar as the uh, independent uh, confirmation on the part of the banks, I mentioned uh, in my uh, opening summary remarks that we uh, did not do that. However, insofar as the other indicators are concerned, uh, we did spend uh, a good bit of time with the uh, DCAA people and the administrative contracting officer people trying to see how they went about doing their analysis. They've been out there uh, for a long period of time. And if you take a look at their reports over time, they're done on a consistent basis. And we rely on other audit organizations. We do this uh, uh, as part of our, uh, of our methodology, and we think it's quite, quite appropriate. And we think so long as they're doing a good job, that we can rely on, on their information. So you didn't find anything unusual about the, uh, the literally secret nature of the way some of these transactions were taken care of? Oh, I think, uh, like you and, uh, and Mr. Horton and, and Mr. Uh, Shays, that uh, there was uh, a veil uh, over what took place right here. And I do not believe that this is the way it should be done. I think that this should be done uh, much more openly than it was. But I think you have to separate the two things. Number one, what indeed was done and, and, and how it was done. Uh, as I said at the outset, I... Well, there, I, may, there may be a connection, Mr. Conahan, for why it was done secretly as opposed to being done publicly. I mean, normally there, there, there's some, some reason that these things go on in, beyond the, the uh, knowledge of all the appropriate parties. And that's what, that's what disturbs us here. We, we have contradictions and conflicts in dates and documents that are, are really quite disturbing over and above uh, what has actually happened. And, and it suggests that there are problems. If, if we negotiated uh, in the government in this manner, uh, GAO would be outraged. You'd, you'd be the lead agency in government telling us we can't do business this way. And that's, that's what we're here to examine and that's what we're saying at these and, and previous hearings. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and insofar as the manner in which this was done, I quite agree with you. As a matter of fact, this document that you have up on the board, we've had that in our position, our possession, and uh, have been uh, discussing that with the Department of Defense in terms <clears throat> of the need to reduce it. I'm very happy to see that you were, were able to do that. I think it's important that that gets out. Uh, there's a lot more information that carries that, that very same stamp on it, and uh, I don't really believe that it is proprietary in nature. I don't think it's all that sensitive. But uh, we do have difficulty in, uh, as government employees in, in re uh, reducing that information. Uh, I'm happy to see that there's a way that we can get that out. Thank you. Mr. Horton. M Mr. Chairman, I have some questions, but uh, Mr. Ireland has to get back. Maybe I should defer to him. Um, uh, as you uh, know, let, he's let, a guest here. Yes, let, let me recognize uh, Andy Ireland, the gentleman from Florida, distinguished leader on the Armed Services Committee, former member of government operations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Ranking Member. I appreciate it. Uh, as you both know, we have uh, a hearing going on this moment about the A-12, as we did yesterday in our House Investigation, uh, House Armed Services Investigation Committee. And I would uh, only like to make three points before I fold my tent and go back over there, because uh, all of you on this committee have been an integral part of fleshing out what's going on here, and, and uh, which is a serious, uh, at least $3 billion problem for this country. Uh, 
I would say uh, 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 these three things. Uh, uh, you have as a witness uh, Mr. Donald uh, Yaki, um, probably little noticed but of great importance. Uh, Mr. Yaki recently, uh, in a memorandum to Controller O'Keefe, uh, outlined the, the need for uh, the services to show full funding for major weapons systems in the out years. That sounds like a very innocuous statement, but it, it goes to the very real heart of the, the, uh, uh, the loading uh, operation that has historically gone in within the military services in the Pentagon on their budgets, and Mr. Yaki, I believe, deserves a great deal of credit for calling attention to that and uh, making that change. Uh, in addition, of course, you'll be talking to uh, Ms. Spector. Uh, I think we've all seen what analysis took place of the overall figures, uh, in my judgment, uh, wholly inadequate, and I think the GAO's uh, comments and such uh, uh, hold that out. One of the great inadequacies was the fact that absolutely no analysis was made to give decision makers uh, an idea of whether the a course of uh, deferment or non-deferment non-deferment perhaps leading to bankruptcy was the best course of action. Absolutely no analysis whatsoever made about that. And the last thing that is an update that I will tell you, and uh, uh, Congressman Mavrulis made this uh, announcement in our meeting uh, just now, an integral part of the A-12 investigation uh, uh, yesterday after our uh, subcommittee took testimony um, uh, that conflicted significantly with the program manager Elberfeld's uh, uh, testimony to us under oath at previous times. Captain Elberfeld uh, met with the Secretary of Navy yesterday and requested that his plan promotion be withdrawn and uh, submitted his application for retirement, uh, which was accepted. And I think that that is an indication that uh, uh, accountability is on the march. And I would only point out that uh, things of the nature that uh, we're talking, you are talking about here and we're talking about in the House Armed Services indicate that despite the roadblocks of Captain Elberfeld, a uh, considerable amount of this information, warning signals, if you will, uh, went to senior managers. Senior management should have at least seen that the kind of work put out by uh, uh, Ms. Spector was an inadequate analysis. Senior managers did get uh, uh, warnings that the, the, uh, the project was uh, behind schedule and over budget. Uh, they ignored them, and I think that it is important, uh, not uh, as important as it was for Captain Elberfeld to take the, uh, uh, the move that he did. Uh, it is also important to realize that others uh, that are in senior management uh, should have at least uh, said, gee, these warning signals are out here this analysis is inadequate, maybe we better look forward. We, we have a right to expect that from senior people at the Secretary of Navy uh, uh, rank. Uh, and I would uh, thank you for your attention and, uh, and also thank you again for your uh, willingness to let me participate from time to time. Well, your yeah. presence here underscores the cooperation that's going on between uh, you and Mr. Marvulis' committee and ours. Uh, I was, in fact, invited to join uh, your committee hearings. Uh, you're holding uh, three days of hearings on this subject, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, we're holding one, but we're working very closely together, and I want to acknowledge that on the record. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you. I want to join with the chairman in thanking Mr. Ireland for coming, and I um, appreciate your uh, assistance and your help, and uh, I agree with the chairman that we're working very closely with the Armed Services Committee on this very vital and important subject. Thank you very much. Mr. Shales. No, Mr. Chairman, oh. I have some questions. Oh, yeah. uh, All right. Kind of Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask a couple of questions um, by way of background. Um, I'd like to have the General Accounting Office's um, um, interpretation of the uh, Federal Acquisition Regulations FAR with regard to deferments. Um, 
uh, is it limited to small companies or financially weak companies? Uh, what is the deferment basis under the FAR regulation? <clears throat> Mr. Horton, I think that, uh, the, that there are some internal inconsistencies in, in that regulation. But in direct response to your question, no, I do not believe that it is limited to small businesses or financially weak uh, contractors. I will just read what it says. Deferments pending dis well, these are the categories of, uh, for which deferments can be made. Uh, deferments pending disposition of appeal may be granted to small business concerns and financially weak contractors. So, so that's, that's one provision. That's provision E. Now, provision D says that uh, deferments can be made to avoid possible overcollection. And that's kind of interesting because the chairman in his opening statement referred to uh, deferments to uh, Delco. And uh, the deferment uh, to uh, Delco, which was uh, a fairly sizable uh, uh, deferment, not on the order of the one we're talking about here, uh, was made uh, for that, uh, that particular reason. Another one that we're investigating for this uh, uh, subcommittee is one to uh, Lockheed. And uh, th that provision was also cited for uh, justification for that one. Uh, there is another provision in here that says that uh, if the contractor is unable to pay at once in full or the contractor's operations under national defense contracts would be seriously impaired. So that there are a whole series of justifications that the uh, FAR seems to provide for. So I don't think that we can uh, have it an either or in terms of small business or financially weak companies. Well, do you think that the uh, deferment, uh, the deferments, given to these uh, two companies, General Dynamics and uh, McDonnell Douglas, are within the uh, deferment uh, FAR regulations? Within the scope of that? Yes, I think within the scope of this. If, if we all agree that those firms are financially weak contractors, has... Well, I haven't agreed, I haven't agreed well, with that. Uh, yes, uh, we... I, I want to get to that in a minute. I'm trying to establish the basis on which the General Accounting Office feels that uh, FAR permits deferment and whether or not it is your view in studying this, the General Accounting uh, Office um, um, study of this, that uh, these deferments were within the scope of the FAR regulations? Yes, sir. We cited a number of uh, events and facts which we believe leads to the conclusion that these companies were in a financial weakened position. And since well, what, I want to get to that in just a minute. But, but that is the basis. And then well, you are putting it on the basis of financially weak uh, corporations. Is that what you are saying? That is correct. That are there any other basis? Well, we had, uh, I think that there was some question that uh, the contractor's uh, operations uh, could be impaired. And we said that as well because there are a number of uh, defense programs that these contractors were responsible for. Well, do you think we need more um, um, clarification with regard to these regulations and also with regard to analysis that uh, lead up to these deferments? I think in view of the uh, discussion that we are having here today, uh, both would be helpful. I think we have to go about it carefully. Uh, the <clears throat> words here are financially weak contractors. I suppose that if we had some elaboration on what that meant, uh, we could uh, have better agreement on whether that condition was met. That is one thing. Secondly, if we had some standards for uh, the kind of analysis that was uh, required, uh, financial analysis required to support uh, a deferment, uh, then we could be closer to, to agreement as to whether those standards were made. Well, that's my understanding from your testimony that um, earlier that um, in your statement that um, in the analysis process that the military, the Department of Defense did not have any documentation and you, you uh, were critical of their analysis of the financial st stability of these two companies. Is that correct? No, I didn't say that they didn't have uh, any documentation. As a matter of fact, there is an well, awful lot. What did you say? Well, there is an awful lot of documentation, and it took us quite a bit of time to, uh, to ferret that documentation out, and it is not all available in one place. It is not available in one place over in the Department of Defense. We had to go out and find it at the uh, contractor's location and, and at other locations. Now, 
when you bring well, now, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you about the Department of Defense. If you had to go out to the contractor to get information, that's one thing. What makes you think they went out to get it? I thought you were critical of their analysis uh, procedures. I was critical of their procedures because I think what they should well, have. Well, tell me what, what it is that, that you were concerned about uh, with regard to the Department of Defense um, um, deferment. I suppose. I suppose uh, the way I, I see that is that if, uh, given that uh, a deferment on the order of uh, magnitude of $1.3 billion was made, I would expect to go in and find that the Department had brought together in one place all of the information that supported that decision. That they said that, uh, you know, here is the financial condition tracked over time of this company, tracked over time of this company. That we think that it can only get to this point insofar as cash flow is concerned. It can only get to this point in terms of its uh, retained earnings. It can only get to this point in terms of the other financial indicators. And once it's at that point, then that permits us to conclude that it, it, it meets the criteria of the regulation right here, that it's in a weakened financial condition. But you found no such, um, no such study, no such analysis. There, there, was no, there was no, no, I didn't say analysis. There was no document that brought that all together. Some of that analysis may have been done. I expect some of that analysis was done. There's no documentation there's that not it was. Documentation I mean, you're just guessing now, aren't you? I'm, I'm guessing that the analysis was done, yes. Well, why do you guess? Well, because I, I mean, don't you know. went out and you checked them, didn't you? Did, didn't you go they, to the Department of Defense? I mean, what good is your analysis if you didn't check them? They told us that they made this analysis. We're talking about two things. Is the information available? As I say, if you go to the Defense Contract Audit Agency, if you go to the Administrative Contracting Office. Mr. Conahan, uh, office, look, in your statement, you just told me a few minutes ago that there was documentation. In your statement on page four, uh, results in brief is the paragraph. There is some evidence that DOD officials did follow a deliberated process in deciding to grant a deferment. However, documentation showing what discussed during this process is not available. There is also no documentation available that indicates why data was used in a particular manner, nor is there a formal document or written decision paper prepared supporting the deferment decision. I mean, that's what you said in your testimony. Well, in uh, my oral comments, I changed it a bit. Uh, I said, well, that's nice. why or how? There are some cases that uh, you find that documentation, but overall, and that's the key, overall that information is not brought together. Well, well wait, I want to ask him a couple more little questions. Uh, <clears throat> now, both these companies, General Dynamics and McDonald, according to my uh, information, this is something that's in Aviation Week and Space Technology, indicates that both these companies are, um, are doing very well. As a matter of fact, their stock is, um, is up and they appear to be financially uh, on sound footing. Um, now you indicated, after you gave us this information with regard to the lack of documentation and the other with regard to the Department of Defense making their decision. You then told us that, that you found information that made it justifiable that they give this deferment. And I'm curious about that. I mean, what basis are you, the General Accounting Office, finding that, that um, this deferment was justifiable or reasonable? I cite it uh, in uh, my statement, uh, uh, Mr. Horton, uh, a series of reports done by the Defense Contract uh, Audit Agency, uh, information that was submitted uh, by McDonnell Douglas and analyzed uh, by uh, the Department of Defense. <clears throat> I uh, cited the uh, um, uh, ratings that uh, were given by Standard and Poor's and Moody's. Uh, I cited uh, additional uh, DCAA and Administrative Contracting Officer uh, analysis. I cited the analysis that was done in connection with the uh, C-17 program and the T-45 program, which was also used in connection with the analysis in connection with uh, this deferment and, uh, and other information. All that brought together at the time the decision was made, in our opinion, did, would not permit us to say that what the department concluded was, uh, was unreasonable. I think per perhaps <clears throat> that uh, a lot of people would have made that same decision based on that information. 
Now, insofar as the well, current again, situation. you're guessing. Well, no, that's our conclusion based on that information. And it's a, a lot of information. It's a fair amount of information. But you went out to the companies and got that information from them. Is that what you're telling Well, not from the companies per se, but from the Defense Contract Audit Agency and the government's administrative contracting officer. For example, I have a DCAA uh, report uh, dated um, April, 5 April 1991. And the overall conclusion is the results of our audit indicate that McDonnell Douglas uh, is in an unfavorable financial condition which would adversely affect its ability to perform government contracts. Now, when now, was this? Th that was April 5th of 1991. April 5th of 1991. In July of uh, 91, according to this market focus, do you have any information about the status of both these companies at the present time? I have an audit report, and I don't have the audit report, but I have a notation that uh, a DCA audit report dated July 16, 1991, says essentially the same thing that I just read to you that was in the uh, April 5th uh, report. Well, I, th this is, of course, just from a, a magazine, and this is uh, what they purport, but they say McDonnell Douglas will likely post earnings of $1.75 uh, $1 to $2 versus $1.49 a year ago. Um, yeah, I don't have that information. I have the DCAA report here. And well, I think it would be helpful if you got the up-to-date information and gave this committee your analysis of what their status is as of now. We're talking about July of 1991, and your analysis was uh, what date? The earlier one? <clears throat> this one right here was April of 1991. And so at that time, it appears as though they're in financial trouble. And according to this, uh, uh, it would appear they're not in financial trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the amount of the waivers? The amount of the waiver? Right, that was given to these two companies. The, the deferral. I mean the deferment. $1.35 billion. Is that for both companies? Yes, sir. And was there also an additional loan to um, either one of these companies? There was a request for a uh, $1 billion loan by McDonnell Douglas. Did they get that? Uh, to my knowledge, no, sir. That request was withdrawn uh, in the early part of April. What's your analysis of General Dynamics financial condition? We have not looked at uh, General Dynamics at all. We were asked to uh, well, take a look. Well, you said they were in better financial shape. Well, I said that the Department of Defense said that they were in better financial shape. Oh, you don't know that? No, no sir, I don't know that. Huh. Well, then, uh, why, would you, um, why would you lump these two together? Wouldn't they, shouldn't they be uh, separated? The um, arrangements of uh, this uh, procurement of the contractual arrangements were that the two companies were jointly and severally uh, responsible for financial uh, liability. Uh, the department uh, determined that uh, General Dynamics possibly could have paid its share, but that it didn't think it could pay uh, uh, both. Uh, and uh, therefore that the analysis had to be done to see uh, what uh, McDonnell Douglas uh, would look like. And that's what we're talking about here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Conahan, if we can't trust you, we can't trust anybody. And you have given answers that, that simply defy logic to me. You basically say they didn't do the analysis. You have no documentation they did the analysis. But if you go through a lot of papers, there can be some justification for what they did. And you, you were asked questions like, did they get a billion dollars? And you basically said in their advance payment, and you said they withdrew it, and to my knowledge, they didn't. Uh, the, the question is, you have no knowledge. Isn't that true? You don't know if they did or didn't? Well, I'm fairly. I'm fairly certain they didn't get this billion dollars right okay, here. Okay, well, this billion, they may have gotten another billion. Is it, do you have any documentation that they may have gotten advance payments of over $700 million? Have you seen any documentation that would give you the idea that maybe they did? On which program? Well, you, you tell me, sir. Well, I think the... I mean, I, let's not play games. The, the reason I say that is they can ask for a, a billion dollars here and then withdraw it and then get $750 million somewhere else. And now they don't need the advanced uh, billion dollars here because they got it in another program. Let me uh, see if I can uh, shed some uh, light on that. Uh, this document... No, I, I'm not interested. I, I'm interested in you answering my question. Yeah, but I think it... I'm no, no, answer I, your question. This is the question I asked. 
the knowledge, you have no knowledge that they got a, a billion dollar advance payment. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. You do not have any knowledge that they didn't. I, have you I, thoroughly they studied? Did not. No, the, the point I'm trying to make is if you've done an investigation, if you've done an investigation and you can tell us to be confident they didn't, that's fine. But if you haven't looked at all the facts, please don't tell us that you don't think they did if you don't know. Let, let me answer that question. I, I need to answer that question. <clears throat> I am certain they did not get this $1 billion right here. Now, the question on the $700 million uh, advance payment uh, stems from a discussion of the C-17 program. And this document that I was talking about up here talks about the C-17 program, and it talks about how possibly during the first six months or so of 1991, $700 million could be made available uh, on the C-17 program. Now, if you take a look at most of that, some of those events did not occur, so that some of that $700 million could not have gone out to McDonnell Douglas. Now, let us take a look at the facts concerning the uh, progress payments to the, uh, on the C-17 program. No, I'm not interested right now. I'm asking you the questions, and if you want to bring it up later, that's fine. The only question I asked you was, uh, uh, can, is it not true that they got advance payments uh, some advance payments, whether it was this billion that they got payments somewhere else. Is that not true? We have not done that work. We were not called upon to do that so work. So you don't know if they got any advance payments anywhere? No, sir. Your testimony to us, you have seen documents, is, and all the documents you've seen, you will tell us that, that you're telling this committee that you have no documentation that they received any advance payments. Beyond the normal progress payments that they would receive on a program. Okay, that's your testimony. And yes. as a matter of fact, right now they're getting flexible progress payments on some of it. And until very recently, and as of today, they're getting either 100% or close to 100% of progress payments on the C-17 program. Mm -hmm. Have you been investigating the C-17 program? Yes, sir. Okay, are you satisfied with how it's operating? No, sir. No, it's got a lot of problems, doesn't it? It certainly does. Okay. Um, let me back up a second. We have an A-12 program uh, for re uh, research and development that was to cost $4.7 billion, $4.8 billion. Is, am I fairly accurate here? That's what the program was to cost? Yeah, the target price on the contract, on the full-scale development contract, was 4.4, .4 and the ceiling price was 4.8. Okay, so between 4.4 and 4.8. Uh, that program was canceled after an expenditure of what, about $2.7 billion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of which uh, it's, a, it's our, our feeling that 1.35 was a deferred payment. In other words, a payment above and beyond what the government feels it should have made for the program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, is it not true that the only thing we basically got for this were six design packages that no plane has been assembled? The only thing we got were the six design packages, yes, yeah. sir. And that, th so we have parts and we have design packages, that's it. That's correct. And we, we've can't, we, Mr. Cheney canceled this program where we have now spent $2.7 billion and, and have given a deferment of 1.35. And now we are going out to, to we're, we're canceling that program and we're going to go to the AX and is it not true that we're looking at $12 billion for research and development, approximately? We've seen that uh, estimate from the Department of Defense. Okay. And, and we'll have a 10-year delay now in the, in, the, in the process of building this plane. So, I mean, that's the general broad picture. Now, what I just find absolutely intriguing is that you have your testimony. When you are pressed for an answer, you then say, well, I said something different in my oral testimony. Uh, in response to, Mr., uh, uh, to my ranking member, Mr. Horton's questions. Which do you want us to listen to? What you say publicly or what's in your document? Insofar as uh, the analysis is, was done, perhaps the written statement is too broad. What I want to say is that we did find some analysis, but overall we didn't find the kind of analysis that should be done. No, let me just say this to you. There was no formal analysis done, correct? There was no formal document, and okay. document capturing all of the analysis that was right. done. So you can't tell us whether there was a formal analysis done because you have not seen one, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, if you have not seen one, then why do you jump to the conclusion that one was done? I didn't jump to that conclusion. What I did was to present a series of uh, information, data, and uh, events that uh, did occur that led us to the conclusion that we took. 
Okay. Now, you are uh, the government accounting office, correct? I mean, you're, you have a job to protect the taxpayers. You have the, uh, the job of protecting and working for Congress in our work. Is this the way it's supposed to happen? No, I think not. And I think I uh, said that at the, at the outset. No, you said this is the way it's not supposed to happen, but this is what they did, and we're satisfied that they did analysis. I didn't say that. You're not. Uh, I didn't they, say that. Well, I, I want to know: Did they do analysis or didn't they do analysis? You're going to have to ask them. They did some analysis. No, no, I'm I, asking you. I don't because know you the full extent of analysis. Okay. The only way that I can tell is one by asking them and then trying to verify what they tell us, and two by looking at documentation. But see, the problem with your doing them and asking them when they can't show you any formal analysis is that you become part of the conspiracy. Rather than being, being on the outside looking in, you are a player now in this mess. We've got to put you into that pile. Because you're covering up, in my judgment, what they've done. Because you have made assumptions that you have no right to make. I thought I accurately reported what took place there. We cannot find documentation for the full extent of analysis that they did. Okay. We can see some analysis that they okay, did. Okay, if you cannot find documentation, then how do you know that the decision was a reasonable decision to provide for deferment? We put together a body of information. And when we analyzed that body of information, we came to the conclusion that we could not say that their decision was unreasonable. That's an interesting term. You can't say it's reasonable, but you can't say it's unreasonable. Well, I'll say that I think if I were sitting uh, in their uh, shoes with the information that I had available to me to include all of the matters that I cited in my uh, statement, I would say that it was a reasonable decision to make. Okay. Yes. And I'll just conclude with these comments. Just one last point. <coughs> is it not a fact that the reason why McDonnell Douglas is in a financial problem is not because of their government contracts, but because they have invested so much in the MD-11 and that the commercial side has a financial cash flow problem? I don't have those numbers before me, but in general, yes, sir. Okay. So their defense side, basically they're getting paid for projects and so on. Maybe there are cost overruns. But where they have their problem is on the commercial side. They have problems on both the defense side and the commercial side. But have they not put a plethora of money into the, into the MD-11? And is it not true that they have not yet had a return for that? The answer is yes. I don't have the numbers, okay. but yes. Well, the problem is that the fact you don't have your, the numbers, you're telling me you've made an analysis and you said it was reasonable that they did what they did, and yet this is a major component of that, of that decision. Well, I, Mr. Mr. Chairman, all I can say to you uh, and to our, to our witnesses is that he's come before us on many occasions, and I have felt very comfortable with his testimony. But, sir, your testimony I find uh, close to shocking. And, and, I, and, I, and I feel that way because you have basically made the comment that they didn't do an analysis, a formal analysis, but now you, I guess, have done the analysis and you're comfortable that they made the right decision. And uh, there's something left out in between. And we're trying to find out what's left out in between. And um, uh, I just look forward to the next test of ours. I thank the gentleman from Connecticut. Recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Schiff. Chairman. Mr. Conian, thank you for your testimony. I just have a couple of things to ask about. One, I'd like to go back a step um, and just talk about the deferment I idea as a concept. Um, if the Navy had not granted the deferment in its claim against McDonnell Douglas and against General Dynamics, what would the Navy have done then to recover this money? The uh, Navy uh, did uh, make a claim. Uh, for the money, but then agreed that uh, at the simultaneous with the claim that it would defer it. And if they had not, if they had not done that, if they had, that is, if they had made the claim and not agreed to the deferment, what exactly would the government do to get the money ahead of a judgment in its in its uh, favor in court? Well, I would expect that the um, um, the contractors would have immediately uh, gone to court as they did six months later. 
to prevent the money from going directly back to the Navy at that point. Correct. Well, that, that's what I'm getting at. And here I'm not as concerned about this incident as so much as this incident as illustrative, from my knowledge, as to how it's, it's supposed to work. Uh, um, is the government supposed to be, is the government supposed to stop payments on other contracts to recover the money if it makes a claim and doesn't give a deferment? <laughs> here's, here's what I'm getting at. In most cases that I know of, if not all, if anyone asserts a claim uh, against another party, that party doesn't have to pay money till there's a judgment against them. So I'm just kind of curious about how the government gets money without a judgment when it doesn't give a deferment, if you can help me with that. Let me ask uh, Mr. Math to give Please. you the detail on it's that. Our, it's, uh, it's my understanding that uh, one of the ways that uh, you can you can uh, recover that money is through offsets on other existing government contracts that are happened to be uh, uh, entered into with that corporation. But that could jeopardize, from the government's point of view, those other contracts if, if it makes the uh, contractor unable to perform. And, and that was largely a concern here, I guess. Well, it, it definitely could have an effect on the other contracts, yes, sir. Um, let me talk about this particular deferment. If, if I understood you correctly, Mr. Conahan, you're saying that um, there is not full documentation of the Navy doing the analysis it said it made, but whether that documentation can be found or not doesn't mean the Navy didn't do the analysis. Do I have that about right? Yes, sir. That's how we tried to <coughs> uh, characterize it. Right. Uh, however, at least you would have expected to find some document in one place that would have gone through all this analysis that normally is what we would have expected with, with an amount of, of this magnitude in, in consideration. That was the point uh, that uh, we were trying to make uh, at the outset. One with, I think there are two parts to this. One, you know, the merits of the case itself and then also the responsibility of the Department of Defense to be able to uh, demonstrate to, uh, to the Congress and the American people that they indeed did discharge their responsibilities before they made their decision. And it's that latter point that we find lacking. Right. So at least in part, the analysis documentation is not adequate in your judgment. That's correct. Right. Now, when you talk about the bottom line, then, um, having, having sifted through the documentation that you can find, either documentation of analysis or underlying information, uh, on behalf of the GAO, do you have a conclusion as to whether the deferment was properly granted by the Navy under the, under the FAR regulations at this, uh, in this incident? Based on everything we see, uh, it was properly granted uh, under the regulations. One final thing I'd like to ask. Um, we had a previous hearing, as you know, on the A-12 contract, and there are hearings going on in the Armed Services Committee, and I don't want to go over all of that. There's been a great deal of discussion already as to how we got to this point and the various points of view. What I'd like is, from the work that you and your agency have done, um, what is the best way for us to go? Is there a way that we can make use of the investment that the taxpayers have already made of over $2 billion, which has resulted, although not in an assembled airplane yet, but in designs and in number of parts? I'm, I understand quite a number of parts, um, if we were to go look at it. Uh, or do you think we need to just start from scratch and, and say we're sorry about that, but it didn't work and we need to be at ground zero? If you care to offer an opinion on that, I wonder if you'd share it with us. Well, I think that the Navy uh, has a responsibility to determine uh, what, uh, if anything, uh, is applicable to uh, other programs or future programs. Uh, we know that uh, they're doing some of that work right now. Uh, we ourselves have been asked to uh, monitor uh, what uh, the Navy and the Department of Defense are being done in that regard. So I, I do believe that there are current responsibilities to determine what is the best disposition of uh, the work that has been done to date. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Gentlemen from Oklahoma and Mr. English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Conahan, I, uh, uh, as I understand, you were sworn this morning. You're under oath. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, were you given access to uh, all documents uh, relating to this matter, as far as you know? No, not as far as I know. There's one document that we've identified that uh, we do not have in hand, though one of our uh, evaluators did see it. And it's a memorandum that went uh, to uh, the secretary uh, through uh, the service secretaries, uh, which uh, indicated uh, their concurrence uh, in, uh, in the uh, deferment action that was taken. 
Why were you not given access to that document? Uh, the deliberative process was cited as a basis for not handing it over to the General Accounting Office. Would you explain that further? Well, I have difficulty in, uh, in explaining that, uh, as I've had uh, for a long period of time. They uh, take the position that it's pre-decisional and that uh, they only need to give to the General Accounting Office decisional uh, uh, information. Uh, we disagree with that, uh, but uh, that, that's where we stand at the moment on that. Mm -hmm. I believe we have the same case here with, uh, with the committee, that that document has been withheld from uh, this committee. Then, uh, so we don't have all the information available to us? That's, that's at least one that we don't have. Okay. With regard to uh, the letters that, uh, the documents that are before us that are displayed, uh, the letter, uh, uh, the statement is for an advanced payment pool arrangement. What is an advanced payment pool arrangement? I don't have uh, any information beyond uh, what I see right there, but as I understand it, that uh, in order to take care of their uh, current cash requirements, they wanted the Department of Defense to deposit uh, the uh, billion dollars into uh, its bank account uh, to use uh, to meet uh, current requirements. Is that a loan? Is that what that is? I see that as a loan. Uh, and then uh, uh, why is it described as an advanced payment pool arrangement? I. Uh, can only look at the words uh, as you, Mr. English. I, I have no idea why that is. Yeah. Is that, um, you think that's just kind of a gussied up way of uh, getting around the fact we need a loan? There, as we understand it, that's what the uh, federal uh, regulations uh, call it. Advanced pool. Well, is that in effect a loan? It's, as we is said. Is that what it, the purpose is under, the, in, under federal regulations? It's. It's the uh, it's a it's a loan, as Mr. Conahan said. Yes, sir. So this it's, is just who did, who drew up this uh, regulation? Is this a DOD regulation? It's a it's a federal regulation. Is federal I regulation? Who drew it up? Where did who it come from? It? There are some statutory bases for it, I believe, and I'd like to. Uh, uh, put that forward for the record if I can. Well, that's what I'm curious about. As I said, I, I don't understand if it's a loan, why don't we call it a loan? And I don't understand if this is what, uh, if this was the intent as far as federal regulations are concerned, then uh, uh, if that's what it, the purpose is, I'd think they'd call it a loan. If it has some other purpose and it's being used here to achieve some other end, in other words, to make an end when in fact this is not, to make it a loan when in fact this is not supposed to be a loan, then that's uh, what I was curious about. Well, uh, it's uh, clear that it was to be used to uh, meet uh, current cash requirements. The information that you have at hand, all the information that you have at hand and conclusions that the General Accounting Office has drawn with regard to this matter, have you uh, provided us today with every bit of information that was provided to you and have you then testified before this committee uh, providing us with each and every conclusion that uh, the experts in the General Accounting Office have come to in the examination of this information? No, I see this as, a, as an interim report. Uh, we have uh, an effort uh, ongoing. Uh, we certainly haven't provided you with, with all of the information. I mean, there are stacks of information. As a matter of fact, we talked earlier about uh, uh, the difficulty in reporting some of this information in an open hearing like this because it is um, um, classified as uh, proprietary or business sensitive and we have some difficulty. Now we would have Who no makes the determination on whether in fact something is actually uh, uh, proprietary or uh, business sensitive? In the first instance, the company uh, designates it as proprietary uh, or business sensitive, but, that there, but there is discussion uh, that occurs after that. Uh, I, uh, I've had some difficulty also uh, with this one in, uh, in determining you know, who had the final uh, say uh, on this. We learned earlier that certainly that those uh, provisions do not apply uh, to the Congress and therefore we're <coughs> able to get this kind of information out. Uh, the statute is fairly clear uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the penalties for uh, release of <coughs> information so designated by a government employee, uh, but it's not all that clear as to who has the final determination for uh, determining that it is indeed <coughs> proprietary. You mean if I um, was the, uh, the head of Company X 
and uh, this month's order for coffee for the coffee room, if I wanted to classify that and say that's proprietary information, then that information could not be released uh, by the General Accounting Office? Well, I don't think that that would hold up. I think And, uh, and the government recipient. As far as I'm concerned, it's proprietary. Now, what basis of law do you have for, uh, for discarding that? I, I, that? I don't have anything beyond the rules, rules of reasonableness. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I would contend that that's not very reasonable. And I don't know how that their position otherwise would be sustained. So you're saying the information and material that has been withheld uh, that, is, uh, that you are not discussing then, in your judgment, is legitimately proprietary? Some of it I do not believe is legitimately proprietary. Then why have you not provided us with that information? Well, well it, it's detailed information, and uh, I, I believe that you have the same information. I mean, the committee has the same information that we have. We're not discussing it here in a public forum today, is all I'm saying. Well, would you identify for us the information that uh, you're withholding? I'd have to uh, go back to the office and, and get the information and go through it, and I can do that. I would appreciate if you would so identify uh, the information that, uh, that you are withholding. Have you been requested by, uh, by anyone uh, to withhold information from this uh, committee? No, sir. And, I, and I'm not withholding information from this committee. Other than that, that has well, been uh, well, labeled as proprietary yeah, by the company. Let me give you an company. example. I, would, I was having an awful lot of difficulty in deciding you know, what I was going to do with this. Now, on this particular letter, we decided as an institution last night that we would have released this. And we told the Department of Defense and the contractors that we would have released this if we were the ones that were called upon to release it. Now, that was our decision. Well, now that, uh, that you have agreed that it, uh, it should be released, and it obviously is released, uh, would you uh, review that and uh, uh, for us would uh, tell us exactly what this means? What do we see here? What, what, uh, what does that uh, note from Eleanor that she's thanking somebody so much for, her, I guess, so much for, and what is uh, the, uh, the attachment? What does all that mean? All right. Well, Mr. English, that's not what we're talking about in terms of being released because that was not uh, uh, designated as proprietary. I was talking about this letter over here. Oh, I see. From McDonnell Douglas. Well, let's, then, let's go. We've talked a little bit about right. that. I raised the question about what is a loan and what is an advanced payment pool arrangement, right, right. And, and I guess it's the same thing. doesn't make any difference. Now, go to uh, the second display. Could you tell me exactly what is it that we're seeing there? What does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> We're talking about the, uh, the C-17 aircraft. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Specter is uh, saying to McDonnell Douglas, when we get together on Thursday, I guess it is, I would like you to be prepared to uh, you know, discuss the following information. And she sets forth up uh, front uh, the assumptions with respect to, uh, to the contract. And number one says uh, use $7.1 billion for the uh, estimated a completion cost for the full-scale education uh, uh, engineering development contract uh, and for lots one and two of, of that aircraft. I might say that the DOD well, well, number... Maybe, maybe before you do that, maybe you should... Would you read for us then the handwritten um, uh, word? Attached, is that attached to are the... Attached are the assumptions we would like you to use in a revised cash flow analysis. Please have it for us when you come in Thursday. Call us if you have any questions. And why would... Uh, why would we do something like that? Well, uh, McDonnell Douglas had submitted some uh, cash flow uh, information, and I think Mrs. Spector wanted to uh, see what that cash flow would look like concerning the C-17 using different assumptions from... Why would you make different assumptions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we were told... I guess you we know, were told by the Department me, of Defense... Let me cut that, through this very quickly sure. and try to save a little bit of time. I guess what I'm... I assume that what we're after or what you would legitimately be looking for are reasonable, responsible, solid assumptions, if you're making assumptions. Now we've got the Department of Defense then coming back to McDonnell Douglas in this case and saying we want you to make these assumptions. We were told by the Department of Defense that uh, you're absolutely correct. McDonnell Douglas came in with uh, certain assumptions with regards to the cash flow. Um, they took a look at them, and they felt that their, their, their assumptions were liberal. I'll, I'll just start with the top one where it says 7.13, whatever that figure is up there. Um, that was the, at that time, the, the Department of Defense estimate at completion. 
McDonnell Douglas had something that was substantially less. They had six billion or something uh, around that uh, number for their figure on the estimate at completion. Well, now, well, now that, just a minute. Yes, sir. Who is the one that's got to perform in this case? Who's the one that has to perform? Mm -hmm. Well, the contractor has to perform. So in this case, McDonnell Douglas? They also have to perform realistic estimates. As we found in A12, the contractor didn't provide realistic, realistic estimates at completion. And I think this is what they're saying as well. McDonald came in with an uh, estimate at completion, and DOD didn't think it was, um, it was uh, accurate. And they said, for your assumptions, use this figure. Did, on what basis did uh, DOD base their assumptions? They based their assumptions on the information that was, as I understand it, gathered from the defense plant representative who's physically located in the contractor's plant who's observing the construction of the C-17 Okay, aircraft. now the second assumption is soon two aircraft will be delivered, uh, ones uh, during uh, calendar year 1991, this T-1 in June and the P-2 in December. Was the, P was the T-1 delivered in June? To my understanding it was not. It was not? It was not. This is an assumption that was made back in uh, uh, Well, this January. was uh, the last day of January. What, uh, it's five months ago? Five months before uh, the, the T-1 was to be delivered? Mm -hmm. My understanding, yes. You mean they, the plant representatives for the Department of Defense at McDonnell Douglas didn't know that the T-1 wasn't going to be delivered in June, back uh, the end of January? Apparently, I would... I would that was their best estimate at the time. First flight is now. When is the, has the has the T1 been delivered since then? No, sir. The, I, I don't believe it's been delivered. Let me you talk. Mean it's it's 30 days late now. Oh yes, sir. I think it's December. T1. The first the first airplane to fly will be December of this so year. So they're six months off on that at least. I, I believe so. And they five months before that, they didn't know they were going to be six months off. It was going to take twice as long as they thought it was going to take. This, uh, this program has had uh, substantial schedule delays right from the very beginning, as and well as cost is, increases. Is the P-2 going to be delivered in December? I don't, I don't have that information. You don't have any idea. Mr. Math, do you know whether P-2 is going to be delivered in December? I don't have that either, Mr. Okay. Anderson. Now we go down and... Uh, we're assuming that uh, lot three negotiations will be completed by the end of February 1991. How do, why would we make that assumption? Um, why would you assume that the negotiations are going to be completed by the end of February 1991? That was 30 days away. I, I can't really uh, get to the assumption here. I can tell you that lot three negotiations were completed in, uh, on March 3rd. Of, it's uh, pretty close, isn't it? Of 1991. Would it, uh, is it I, during I, this time, I want to make sure I understand things. During this time, did we have a situation where McDonnell Douglas and the Department of Defense were in negotiations? Is that correct? Yes, sir. And we have here the Department of Defense saying we are going to complete negotiations by the end in the next 30 days. Is that, that right? Their, that was their best estimate according to this document at the time. Well, if I was in negotiations with somebody and they told me, say, hey, you know, I've got to get up and go home by the end of March, so I've got to have it wrapped up, I'd say that'd give me something of an edge going in negotiations. I think that uh, one of the uh, things that we have been concerned a bit about over time are the optimistic estimates with respect to both uh, schedule and cost that you see on part of both the contractors as well as the Department well, of Defense. Well, I am what I ask you. The question I ask you is, if I tell you, hey, I've got to get up, get up and go home by uh, 5 o'clock today, so while we're sitting here trying to reach an understanding, I've got to have an agreement by then. You know, I've got to go. I've got to leave by 5 o'clock. Are you going to have an advantage in negotiations with me, if, if you know that, uh, that I've got to leave by 5 o'clock and I've got to have something agreed to by, by 5 o'clock today? Well, I think under uh, your scenario, certainly. Well, what, isn't that the scenario we've got right here? That you, we're telling you, assume that it's going, the negotiations are going to be completed by the end of February, 30 days away from then. I suppose it could be construed like that, but... Well, uh, how else would you construe it? Well, I'm not going to construe it. I'm uh, going to let the author of this paper, who's going, coming up next, uh, Well, we're going to do question. that, but, you know, that's what we pay you for. You know, we pay you to, to construe 
and we pay you to reach conclusions. I mean, we can sit here and read this. I, you know, I, we don't need you if, if, if that's the case. We expect you to provide us with your best informed sense of what the situation is. And, I, you know, as I said, it seems pretty simple to me. If somebody's telling me I'm going to complete negotiations in 30 days, period, I'm just been handed a, a, pretty, a pretty good uh, bit of leverage in this negotiations. Now, we're also telling you that we're going to assume that we're adding an additional $338 million to the existing lot, lead, lot three long lead document to cover termination of liability incurred until uh, the uh, signed uh, contract is executed. What are they doing? Giving $338 million more while we're in negotiations? What they're saying, as I understand it, is that if the uh contract for the uh, long lead items is uh, terminated, that they are setting aside $338 million to cover termination costs. Is that normally uh, something that is negotiated? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. The termination costs are negotiated. So in effect, what we're saying, hey, we're in negotiations and I've got to get up and, you know, I've got to have this thing finished here in 30 days. And uh, by the way, even though we're negotiating about it, I'm going to give you an additional $338 million. I don't it, think that I would want to make that number available. Mm -hmm. the, that wouldn't be very wise, would it, Mr. Conahan? I don't think I would at this yeah, point. Yeah, that would kind of put you to disadvantage, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like, you know, throwing in your hand. Yes, I, I just don't think yeah, that I want to do like it. Me. If I All just right. could add, add one thing. It's, yes, sir, it's, Mr. Mass. It's not an advance of money, it's a, it's a contingent liability, so it's not a, a loan per se. It's As a benefit, case, isn't it? It's, pardon me? Isn't that a benefit? It's, it's a contingency. If the, if the contract is terminated, then they will, they will get that money. Yes, isn't that but what's it's a called sweetening in the pot? It, it's called a contingent liability. It's conditioned yeah. on something happening, a That's, termination of the contract. That, do but they always uh, provide uh, uh, this kind of uh, a provision uh, in a contract? I don't know that I can support always, but it is not uncommon to is have that termination. That's negotiated, or is that something that's granted going in that we're going to give you this? It's negotiated. Well, if it's that's negotiated and we're negotiating, then why in the world would you give it away? Well, because it's it's my understanding. Again, as Mr. Kind said, we asked the next witness, but it's my understanding that this was to develop a cash flow analysis as part of the decision as to whether they were going to provide the one billion dollars. Well, let me let me payment. tell you what what it appears to me, what I understand is supposed to be taking place, and you tell me where I'm wrong. It's my understanding that we have the United States government through the Department of Defense negotiating with a vendor. They're negotiating to get the best possible price that they can for the taxpayer. That's what they're negotiating, supposedly. We're trying to acquire something, in this case an airplane, and we're trying to get it at the cheapest possible price. Now what we have here is we have the United States government through the Department of Defense tell them, say, now, gosh, we've got to have this wrapped up now in 30 days. So we've only got 30 days and we're going to, to, to strike this kind of a deal. And by the way, even though I know we're negotiating over this and this is what we normally negotiate, I'm just going to throw this in, $338 million, we're just going to pitch in the pot. And that's what they did, didn't it? It's, um, it's, I don't know where the th Didn't they throw in figure. a $338 million benefit, just pitch it in the pot, and they they put in on it, just threw it right in, didn't we? For a contingent liability, yes. All right. Now, now we're also subject saying... Subject negotiation, as I understand. Let me also say, then the next we're going to say on completion of Lot 3 negotiations, assume an additional $52 million will be added to existing Lot 4 long lead document. So we're going to throw in another $52 million benefit, just pitching it in the pot. That's what we're telling you when we're telling you to assume that. Isn't that right? Well, I don't, I don't know what McDonnell Douglas had in their pot in terms of their cash flow is what, what I'm saying. I don't have that. Well, other, I so. just said, looks to me like you're sure dealing them a lot of cards. What I'm, well, well, you know, some, all I'm saying is what we were told is that these, these were what they felt were the more realistic well, assumptions to be considered as a cash flow analysis. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, out in my part of the country, Mr. Math, out in western Oklahoma, you know, they go through and read this, it looked like they're dealing the cards underneath the table. That's the way it looked to folks out in my part of the country. This looked like a pretty sweet deal. It's one of these things it's, uh, it's, you can't miss. 
This is not tough negotiations in, beh in behalf of the taxpayer. This is what you call stacking the deck. And that's what uh, I think troubles this committee a good deal. And I've got to say, uh, with my colleagues, I'm concerned about the reluctance of the General Accounting Office to really get in and dig on this one. It, feel like, it seems to me there's a lot of dancing around going on over GAO on this issue, and, and quite frankly, that's a disappointment. I, I would hope that you all would, uh, would uh, not take anybody's word for anything and get in there and dig out the facts. Yeah, Thanks, Mr. Mr. English, Mr. English, Mr. Chairman, yes, I, would, I would like to make a comment on that. Sure. Uh, we uh, are here today uh, to testify on the deferment uh, action. Uh, this uh, piece of paper that we've been going over right here uh, really uh, does not relate in a, in a direct way to the deferment action. And uh, so, therefore, I see this as, as something, you know, outside of, of, of what our work to date has been called upon to do. Now, I quite agree with you. We, we're aware of this sort of stuff, and I have the same concerns that you have uh, on this. And as a matter of fact, this information was used as part of the decision of, of, of the analysis in the final days on this thing. But this does relate to, the, uh, uh, to this matter right here, uh, rather than to some of the earlier things that we were talking about. Well, let me read you your own testimony then. Let's read the testimony here. On page 9 it says, DOD was not making a single decision focusing only on the granting of deferment but was also being asked to consider providing additional financial assistance to McDonnell Douglas. This is part of an overall approach to McDonnell Douglas. Yeah, and no, it's my I, understanding that, that your responsibility is to follow the trail wherever it goes, no, and certainly this is part of the trail. No, I quite agree with you. Okay. What I'm talking about in terms of the slice of this uh, as to whether it makes contractual sense in negotiations to do this. That's, that's the only point I'm And this making. was a part of the package of the documents that were provided to you by DOD, is this right? Uh, yes. So if it's a part of the package, evidently DOD thought it had something to do with it. So I don't think you can say that this is outside the realm of what GAO was supposed to be looking at. Well, I guess what I'm saying, what was outside the realm was the specific, uh, um, the, the specific intent of, of these individual items in terms of taking a look at future cash flow. Well, wouldn't you say that this little document here those little provisions I was talking about, those little benefits of $338 million on, on one item and $52 million on the other, don't, don't you think that kind of smells to high heaven? Oh, as, as you go through it the way you did, this certainly seems to give uh, McDonnell Douglas uh, an awful lot right up front. Yeah. So my characterization that it does smell high to, to high heaven is correct, is that right? You agree with that? Why don't you let me stay with my characterization? Well, I'm just trying, you know, my <laughs> folks from western Oklahoma that are watching this, they like, you like, like straight talk, Mr. Conahan. Let's just be straight with them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From Oklahoma, uh, this was supposed to be a short first witness, but uh, this testimony has uh, tried the patience of the members of this subcommittee and I, I want to just close it down, uh, and I know uh, my friend from Connecticut uh, wants to comment on this as well, but look at the Code of Federal Regulations 163.27. Financial information and analysis, and what the Department of Defense is to use as a standard in uh, examining these financial uh, analyses. The necessity for financial information and analysis and the scope, depth, and detail of analysis of the financial capability of contractors for contract financing purposes must vary reasonably with circumstances of particular cases. The obtaining of information relevant to financial capability and the analysis and proper evaluation of that data are of particular importance where the contractor is on any current list indicating current or past contract defaults or delinquencies. Now is there any study that you came across to show that DOD complied with that provision in the Code of Federal Regulations in the course of your analysis? Mm -hmm. We didn't. 
No, Mr. We did not come across the, the, no. and the you, documented you did not. analysis you're talking about. Well, is it not correct that uh, this subcommittee staff provided it to GAO over a week and a half ago, this, this uh, information itself? Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that this financial analysis is applicable to the, uh, the analysis made prior to awarding a contract to a contractor. And uh, according to uh, my understanding, not to the particular situation at hand. In other words, uh, uh, a, an effect alone of uh, 1.35 billion doesn't kick in these same examinations and requirements. That's that's my understanding. Yeah, in other words, the Mr. information we sent you was irrelevant to this hearing uh, because it doesn't fit. Uh, the, the definition of a, of a deferral? One of the difficulties, Mr. Chairman, as we've talked many times, is that uh, these FAR provisions right here are sometimes difficult to uh, uh, relate. I'm told by counsel that this relates to the awarding of a contract but does not uh, specifically relate to the kind of a uh, uh, situation we have here at deferment. 163.13, scope of subpart. This subpart sets forth basic policies applicable to guaranteed loans, advance payments, and progress payments. I can't dispute what I just heard you read. Well, and we're working along together. We're, we're giving you the clue on that. Would you read that again one more time, Mr. Chairman? Sure. This subpart sets forth basic policies applicable to guaranteed loans, advance payments, and progress payments. Look, now, if you're, if you're going no, to take no. these regs and, and, and slice them into parts where we, we've got a, a, a billion three deferral and say that that doesn't fit into any of these definitions, uh, it's true we'll go back and rewrite it. But it's strange to have this kind of argumentation coming from the General Accounting Office. But now, you will permit us to take a look at that and get back to you? In as much as it be my guess, be my right. guess. Uh, let, let me uh, ask uh, Chris Shays to close this down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've decided this is just a very bizarre part of our hearing and I am calming down here. I'm new here and I have to learn that the system works this way. Um, you were asked by Mr. Schiff uh, whether regulations were followed, and I wrote down the deferment was properly granted under the regulations. That's what you said. And we sent you some regulations. You have said they don't apply because council said they don't apply. Then uh, the chairman reads you uh, an example of how it would seem to apply. But um, let's forget the regulations we sent you. You made a very strong statement. Uh, tell me what regulations you're following. This was um, section uh, 32.613E. Uh, okay. We said, uh, which says that uh, deferments pending disposition of appeal may be granted to small business concerns and financially weak contractors with a reasonable balance of the need for government security against loss and undue hardship on the contractor. Right. Sir, you're too intelligent to tell me that that is the total. We're not disputing whether they have a right to apply for a deferment. We want to know a little more than that. You are the second in command of the GAO. Is that the basis for your making this comment, that they followed all the regulations? The, the question that we had earlier was this regulation right here. No, you were asked a question. You said deferment was properly granted under the regulations. Well, under the deferment regulation. Regulations, the deferment That's, regulations. Is that, is that the total part of it? Oh, no. No, okay. we didn't. So let me, just, let me just, for your own protection and our own knowledge, right. you were asked whether the regulations were properly followed. You carry a lot of weight, and the company will use you as a defense. Is it your testimony before this committee that all the regulations were properly followed by the Navy, the Department of Defense, and the contractor? Oh, certainly not. Well, that, oh, certainly not. Well, Could I couldn't expand? make that statement. Well, uh, thank you. 
but you did earlier. You said the deferment was properly granted under the regulations. Well, what we, am I, I thought we were talking about second. the deferment regulation, what, this section of the FAR. What am I to assume as a new congressman here when someone in your status comes and says to us the deferment was properly granted under the regulations? You didn't provide any qualification. You just made that statement. Is that a true statement? No, I think that we were talking in the context of this regulation at that time. Now, when you broaden it to cover all regulations, my statement is that I'm in no position to uh, assure you that they were complied with all of the regulations. There are a multitude of regulations. No, no, here. let's not play games here. I'm not. No, you are playing a game. And, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I just can't just let it drop here. The inference was that the regulations were followed. Uh, dealing with the deferment. Is it your testimony that that is the total, complete element to the regulations governing deferment? Is that your statement before us? I'm saying this, sir, that <clears throat> the FAR has a section in here on uh, deferment of collection. Yeah. And it goes for about a page and a half. And my testimony is that based on the work that we've done to date, that they have complied with this section right here. Wait, which provision. merely says they have a right to apply, correct? Well, it and says that they may be granted. Yeah, they may be granted. But uh, are you saying that there's no process that governs these regulations, no process that they have to follow? They can be granted simply. We just allow a department to grant someone a deferment with no process? Uh, you know, I just, um, I will take your testimony in a very limited way now that the chairman has rightfully questioned you on it. If, and if, uh, if I could just mention yes, one thing, Mr. Shea, is that the regulation we were talking about in terms of financial analysis, to my understanding, does not apply to deferment. It applies well, then to tell, the tell granting me what of a does contract. Apply. The regulation that is we're that talking about. Is that the total? It, it, you, you are speaking on behalf of the GO, and you are yes, saying. Sir. In your, with all your expertise that that is the total element and regulation that governs deferment? With regards to the deferment, the regulation that Mr. Conahan cited is the regulation so that is applicable. So it's just basically, so we're uh, looking please, at apply, that. please apply if you are one of these and, and, and that's it? With the existing criteria that's in there for application and granting of a deferment. Yes, sir. I think this uh, whole uh, hearing uh, has to do with whether there was uh, justification no, uh, for it. The, no. The, the hearing has to, to follow whether there was a process followed. We're not going to go after the fact and say were they justified. We are going to decide whether a process was followed because we're not talking about $1,300. We're not talking about $10,300. We're not talking about $1,300,000. We're talking about $1.3 billion. And I do not believe that this government would allow for such an open-ended process. But you seem to be endorsing it. Because you're saying that was the regulation and they followed it and no other regulation governs. That's your testimony. And I find that pretty shocking. And, and hard to believe. I do. I find it hard to believe. And that includes the process, yes, sir. That includes the process as well. That's your testimony. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll have to change the law and also uh, work with GAO more closely on that. Mr. Chairman. The reading of where deferments. Uh, Fit into I, this exam. Yeah, I'm not, I just don't feel that we should let the GAO off as easily as we are or the company to say that that is on, the only element that governs this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I'm just not going to all of a sudden say, well, somehow we now have to change the regulation. Uh, can I make a comment on that, please? <clears throat> we said from the outset <clears throat> that we did not see that the, uh, we were not able to determine that the Department of Defense made the kind of analysis that we thought would be reasonable to support the decision that was taken. True. One. Two, we said that that was not brought together in any one place. We said we went out to see what we could find about what they had before it. <clears throat> and we looked in the Department of Defense, in the Department of the Navy, and in a number of uh, defense agencies, such as the Defense Contract Audit Agency, out at the Administrating Contracting Officer Shop, and so on. Now, there are processes and there are regulations associated with all of the various bits and pieces of, of, of all that sort of stuff. Indeed, when you're talking about whether or not uh, you can rely on a, a DCAA report, 
you have to take into account both the, uh, the standards, the principles, and regulations that apply to the uh, uh, conduct of, a, of an audit by DCAA. And we test those standards out. And in some cases, we, we find that they're done very well, and others that, uh, that they aren't done very well. So that coming back to your statement right there, in terms of the totality of this transaction, we have to look at regulations as they apply to DCAA, as to the uh, responsibilities of the contracting officer, as to the responsibilities of the procurement people, and so on down the line. And I, I, I think that they all have to be taken into account. And that, under that basis, then the regulations were not followed. That's correct. I can't, I can't make the statement that all those were followed, so, though I have to say that I didn't look at compliance well, across but, the board. But, but basically you're saying some regulations were followed and some weren't. That's your testimony, really, isn't it? Th that. But I can't give you a global statement because I can't say that we look for compliance with all applicable regulations. Well, but, but then you are qualifying that the deferment was properly granted under the regulations. You are qualifying that statement. Uh, yes, under this regulation. Thank you. Mr. I would like to uh, go back for a minute because when I was asking you questions earlier, you did indicate that, uh, that you were concerned about the process and that they didn't have the documents and all the other information which you thought they should have had in order to make that deferment. I also ask you with regard to um, the basis for the deferment, which is basically $1.35 billion for these two comp companies. You indicated to me that the, the, um, your understanding or your analysis of the basis for that uh, deferment was a financially weak company. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I mean, that basically was what your, your statement was. That's correct. Um, you did not find documentation or sufficient uh, information from the Department of Defense upon which to um, um, find that they uh, had um, gone through that type of process. But then you found additional information which you said made it, uh, at least in your opinion, a reasonable decision for that loan. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. Now, um, one of these companies, nobody has ever, has ever questioned, and, and uh, you indicated General Dynamics was not, uh, I think your, your language was that, uh, that they were um, not as, as bad off as the uh, as, as McDonald was. Is that basically correct? I reported that the Department of Defense made that statement. All right. And then both these companies shared in this deferment of $1.35 billion. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, I still think that uh, when, when you're talking about just a few months difference from the data that, that you looked at, that is the General Accounting Office, and the information which apparently uh, is true, that uh, both these companies are, are very solvent in, ju in July of 1991, that it would be important for this committee to have your analysis of that situation as of July of this year. In other words, what is the financial status of those two companies as of now? Can you get that information? I'd be happy to make that reconciliation for you. Yes, sir. And I think that would be very helpful right. for us in, in the uh, Yes, and the understanding here, and I think you also ought to indicate uh, what has changed so substantially in that uh, brief period of time. The, the data that you were looking at was dated what? April of 91. Oh, so we're talking about <coughs> April and, to and July. And July. And July. There's, there's you information have an from that, Mr. Mayor? There's information from the uh, corporate uh, administrative contracting officer that, uh, and it, in his documents dated July, that the, uh, the, the concern with the financial health of McDonnell Douglas is the same now as it was before. And we're talking about cash flow. In other words, the, the ability well, this to is a different pay thing. This is a different thing. The, the, uh, the required $676 million, whatever that figure is. So we're talking about cash flow and the ability to pay. And that was the original um, reason for for the deferment. Okay, thank you. Not the, not the stock. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. So much for a short uh, hearing with the GAO this morning, uh, Mr. Conahan. You're the number four three man in GAO. You know we have an oversight hearing on GAO coming up this fall. Yes, sir. I do. Okay. Keep that in mind. <coughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, we now would like to turn to our final panel of witnesses, the Honorable Donald J. Yaki, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, is, who's uh, uh, then we have the Honorable Robert McCormick, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management, and Mrs. Eleanor R. Spector, Director of Defense Procurement Department of Defense. We welcome you on behalf of the subcommittee. Uh, we ask you to please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I help you God. Thank you very much. Please be seated. We have your, your statement. Uh, before you begin, Mr. Secretary, uh, you must know that we've been asking for all the documents related to the deferral decision, and either you or your department have been refusing to provide us with the so-called decision memorandum. This committee has been seeking to work cooperatively with you for a fair amount of time. We wrote you on April 19th, then on June 13th. Uh, I, I want to indicate in person and publicly that we need and want this document. This is a, a demand request. The law is very clear. 5 U.S.C. Section 2954 requires the cooperation of your department with this committee in the exercise of its oversight responsibility. In addition, the doctrine of executive privilege shields only personal consultations with the President of the United States by his immediate advisors. Third, as both case law and a November 4, 1982 memorandum from President Reagan recognizes an assertion of executive privilege requires the direct approval of the President. The Department, therefore, has not met any of these conditions with reference to your memorandum. And so, as we've indicated uh, in our last letter to you, that uh, we, we're making uh, June 13th a final effort to resolve these problems. Uh, we've we pointed out uh, as clearly as we can that if the President decides to invoke executive privilege, the department head shall advise the requesting congressional body that the claim of executive privilege is being made with the specific approval of the President. And so, uh, we have negotiated, written letters, we're now talking in person, and it, it is my responsibility to advise you that uh, we have received uh, none of the uh, conditions required to uh, invoke executive privilege, and so I'm, I'm going to notify you that uh, as of next Monday, uh, this subcommittee will be prepared, if this matter is not resolved, to take whatever legal action that we are empowered uh, to take to secure the documents in question. And with that, yes, I yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma. Subpoena these documents. It means that we will like take that subject April. matter under consideration. Now, I appreciate the chairman. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Uh, with that uh, a friendly discussion, we welcome you to the witness table and, and, and invite your discussion on uh, this matter and, and any others related to this subject. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll certainly convey those remarks to the General Counsel of the Department of Defense. I have with me today Mrs. Elner Spector, our Director of Defense Procurement, and Mr. Robert McCormick, our Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management. The subcommittee previously heard the testimony of Mrs. Spector on the deferment of the 812 debt and related issues. And since this is the first hearing of the deferment decision that Mr. McCormick has participated in, I would like to take just a moment to give you a brief summary of his background. Mr. McCormick has a master's degree in business administration with a concentration in finance from the Graduate School of Business, University of Chicago. 
He spent 19 years in the investment banking industry, specializing in corporate finance matters before coming to the department in 1987. He became very familiar with the financial condition of McDonnell Douglas beginning in July of 1990, which was based on his reviews of publicly available financial data and discussions with the corporation's chairman and chief financial officer. We have provided the, the subcommittee in the general accounting office with the background information on our deferment. I hope that your review of the deferment decision, as well as the review completed by the general accounting office, has led them to the same conclusion that the department reached, namely that the deferment was appropriate and in conformance with applicable regulations. The fundamental question remains the same. Was our decision reasonable and supportable? We continue to believe that any review of the financial data available to the department at the time in question will clearly show that the contractors did not have the money available to repay the $1.35 billion debt and that they could not readily obtain it. McDonnell Douglas in particular had cash flow problems and we believe that demanding repayment could have resulted in lending institutions limiting or withdrawing sources of credit, thereby accelerating the problems that McDonnell Douglas had. The department could not lose sight of the fact that if bankruptcy had, did occur, it could have allowed McDonnell Douglas to reject several large ongoing Department of Defense contracts that are in a lost position. The total amount of the losses on those contracts exceeded McDonnell Douglas' share of the deferred A-12 debt. If the department had been forced to renegotiate those contracts in a bankruptcy environment, to eliminate the losses being incurred by McDonnell Douglas, the department could have ended up paying more than we would have received through immediate repayment of the A-12 debt. If we insisted on immediate repayment, we faced the likelihood that we would not receive the money and that we would also set in motion a series of actions that would have ended up costing the taxpayer even more money. We believe that it was more prudent and more likely that the department would ultimately recover the $1.35 billion owed it if a deferment were granted. As to the criticism that the analysis was not extensive enough, we believe it was more than sufficient to support the decision. The department had been performing an ongoing review of the overall financial condition of McDonnell Douglas for almost six months prior to the deferment, primarily due to the losses on the C-17 and the T-45 programs. Thus, the, if the financial data supplied in support of the request for deferment should not be considered as a stand, standing alone. Rather, it was part of all the information we were receiving on McDonnell Douglas financial condition, and the department clearly had an ongoing familiarity with the company's financial situation. GAO has just stated that we may not have done what we should have regarding collection of the data in one place or in compiling in a document in support of our analysis. Yet GAO came to the same conclusion that our decision was in fact reasonable based on the same data that we used. I listened very carefully to Mr. Cochran and he described what GAO relied on. All of it was supplied by the Department of Defense. The bottom line remains is that this deferment was reasonable and supportable by the facts of the situation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The other witnesses and I are available to answer your questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let me ask uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy two questions. What's the general position of the Department of the Navy with reference to deferments? The Department of the Navy is in agreement with the decision to defer payment to McDonnell Douglas and to General Dynamics. Uh, that, that isn't the question. The question is, what is the general position of the Department of Navy regarding deferments in general? The Department of the Navy's policy on deferments is to look, them, look at them on a case-by-case -case basis and to make a determination, recommendation based on the facts in a particular case. There is no general, overall, we do this for, for uh, one way or we don't. It depends on the circumstances at the time. Well, have you ever given a deferment before? No, I have not. Has uh, any of your pre predecessors, uh, uh, your uh, prior predecessors ever done that? Well, I can tell you, I've, I've checked the record, 
uh, the Navy in general doesn't give deferments. And that's what's been told GAO by the Navy. Let me ask you, you signed a deferment agreement on behalf of the government. Will you describe for this committee the circumstances surrounding the request for you to do that? The circumstances regarding that particular uh, issue began on February, on January 7th with the termination, cancellation of the A-12 contract. We were approached by McDonnell Douglas. Between that time and the time that deferment was uh, granted, where they presented us with data that supported their position, that they did not have the financial resources to meet that obligation at this time. I agree with that assessment. And uh, after extensive work with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Air Force, and the Navy primarily, with the Army participating somewhat, we reached a uh, decision that it was in the best interest of the government and the Department of Defense to grant the deferment. As the deferment was relating to a Navy program, I was the appropriate official who uh, executed that agreement. Did you make the decision? Did I make the decision to ex execute that agreement? No, did you make, did you make the decision uh, that there would be a deferment agreement? The decision with respect to the deferment agreement was arrived after a, an analysis of the impact the request would have on the total business operations of McDonnell Douglas, how it would affect the Department of Defense and related contracts. Who made the deferment agreement? The deferment that the decision? The deferment decision was made uh, based on a recommendation which I agreed with. Yeah, I, I know that, that the record shows that, but let, let's, let's save time here. This isn't a, a trial. Didn't it go to the, the gentleman sitting to your right? And did, didn't it go to the lady sitting to his right? It went, it went upstairs to Secretary Yaki and Ms. Spector, did it not? If it's acceptable to you, Mr. Chairman, I believe I can answer that question. Well, you, I know you can. Uh, but I also think that the Assistant Secretary of the Navy can, too. The decision was based on an analysis that was done jointly by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Navy, and the Air Force. Right. A recommendation... It, it, it went upstairs, A recommendation it? was made to Mr. Yaki, who in turn made a recommendation to Mr. Atwood, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. Well, what about Ms. Spector? You, you don't mean you cut out the procurement, uh, the procurement person in the Department of Defense? It, as I think you're aware, Mrs. Spector works for Mr. Yaki, so I don't think you can attribute that she was cut out of anything. She was a uh, participant with, uh, okay. with us in this process, that, as that she so us, testified. That brings us right back to my question. And uh, everybody here is, is uh, y you know, you're holding the nation in suspense. Who made the decision that there would be a deferment? Well, you want to? I tried to answer, but he would you? I else. mean, I think we're well, answering if you the don't question. Know, we're you're perfectly at liberty to say so. I think I've described what the process was to you, Mr. No. Chairman. Okay. Well, then, then, we, then we, can, we can assume that you... Do, do you understand the question? I certainly understand you do. the question. Okay. You understand that you've been non-responsive, that you haven't told us who. Are you refusing to answer the question? I think I've answered the question. I see. Okay. Well, then what is the answer as to who made the decision for a deferment? Just let me know because I haven't heard it yet. The Navy made the decision to grant the deferment okay. based 
on a recommendation to Mr. Yaki, which he concurred with, and it was reviewed by the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Is it? You want to elaborate on that, Donner? Well, that takes care of that. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. McCormick. You, you've been as helpful as I'm sure that you could be. You also are reminded that you are under oath and that you've not responded to this question that's been put to you at least three times. Now let me turn to the Director of Defense Procurement. Now at this table, we don't need people answering for other people. Uh, when I ask somebody the question, that's the person that I want the response from, not from somebody that knows the answer that wants to answer for them. Now, uh, Mrs. Spector, you've heard the GAO testify that there was no documented analysis, or there was very little. In our own review of these documents, we found nothing that could even pass for a financial analysis involving this amount of money. And this apparently seems to conflict with your testimony in April, and we ask you to identify for the committee the, analy the analysis performed by the Department of Defense uh, of McDonnell Douglas and, and General Dynamics. The analysis basically consisted of we received cash flow information from the contractors month by month by month and by program. We saw their cash flow, McDonnell Douglas's, was negative in, in many of the months. We then got their available bank financing and what their available loans were and determined it was insufficient to cover the cash flow. We had that information, uh, uh, the cash flow information, um, verified by our corporate ACO that they had been using it, the company had been using it, and that was usable by us for the purposes for which we were using it. We then said what would happen if we didn't defer and if we demanded the money. Our concerns were McDonnell Douglas's banks might default or might not continue extending them credit. And if that were to happen, there was a possibility that the company might go into bankruptcy and in addition might not continue to perform two very large contracts where the loss exceeded the amounts they owed us. So our ultimate concern at the conclusion of our analysis was if we did not defer, we might never get repaid the amount that we were deferring I because the I, loan I would be I understand the reasons, but you, you, I ask you for the analysis. Do you have the analysis? The analysis consists of our reviews of all of the documents that we were provided, the same documents we provided you and to GAO, and GAO reached the same conclusion we did based on the same well, documents. Well, we don't need you to interpret it. We've had GAO before us for two hours. Let me just ask you this. You, you say there was an analysis. There was. Okay. Can we have it for the, this committee? Sir, I have said several times, there is not a document. There is no single document. There is a, a view graph presentation that comes closest to it that was presented <coughs> right. on the 31st. We have provided that to you. And, and that's, that's, what, that's your response to my request for the analysis. You have been told there is no other existing single document that pulls together all of our analysis other than that which is a set of conclusions and reasons for the conclusions. That is all that exists. There is extensive documentation. There is not one single document that summarizes it all in one place. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, you've said that the data is adequate and that you've done a very thorough analysis. Uh, is that a statement to which you still stand? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you've also said that the analysis was done in your office and that you participated in it. Is That's that correct? Yes, sir. And is that... Uh, but the analysis consists that you have presented to us our slides and then you say that there's supporting data that goes all over the place 
And that, that consists of the, the analysis. As to quote Mr. Conahan, there are stacks of documents that we reviewed, including publicly available financial data, including data from the contractors, data from our own defense contract audit agency. There is a, an abundance of data available that we analyzed to determine that these companies could not have afforded to repay a billion point three debt. Yes. Well, here's GAO. Uh, there is some evidence that Department of Defense officials did follow a deliberative process in deciding to grant a deferment. However, documentation showing what was discussed during this process is not available. There is also no documentation available that indicates why data was used in a particular manner, nor is there a formal document or a written decision paper prepared supporting the deferment decision. In other words, in your own language, you said you reviewed other documents and that that constituted your analysis. We did an extensive review of financial data that existed. There is not a single summary of all of that, okay. but we do have all the financial data that supported our analysis that drove us to our conclusion, which was the correct conclusion. Well, that's your opinion. That's why yes, we're it is. here. And, and, and we, GAO's we respect opinion. it. Well, it isn't GAO's. Well, I, I, won't, I won't argue with you about GAO's opinion. Uh, let me quote uh, a part of the regulation that uh, I think uh, has some effect on your conduct in this matter, 163.27a. Quote, the obtaining of information relevant to financial capability and the analysis and proper evaluation of that data are of particular importance where the contractor is on any current <coughs> list indicating current or past contract defaults or delinquencies, or there are any known facts or circumstances which support reasonable doubts as to the contractor's financial capability. Do you agree that that's a uh, relevant part of the regulation that, not, that not you're working with? Not to deferment, it's, it's not relevant, no. It is irrelevant. It is not relevant. It is not the relevant. deferment decision is my understanding. Okay. All right. Uh, this same regulation makes a reference to particular requirements when there is a federal tax deficiency, including an independent verification with the Internal Revenue Service. Was any independent verification made with the IRS as to the amount of taxes due from McDonnell Douglas Corporation? No, it was not. And I, I again, I am not. I'm not familiar with what you're reading from, but it is not my understanding that that is relevant to the deferment decision process where the rules are laid out in the Federal Acquisition Regulation and we follow them explicitly. So it, it would make no difference to you uh, whether they, they had a... Uh... You said the, the rules are laid out explicitly on the regulations governing deferment explicitly? In the FAR. In the Federal Acquisition okay. Regulation, you just, rules are laid out could and you, we follow Could you them. just, while, while the Chairman asks you questions, I would love to, to have you make reference to where so we can look at those uh, rules that were explicitly followed. There, it's at, I'm reading, uh, I'm looking at 32.610, 32.613, deferment of collection. This slow down, slow down, please. Far 36, 32.6. 32.613, deferment of collection in the FAR. And these are the rules that were followed explicitly yes, by sir. you? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we, we're reading uh, how to perform an analysis from what I'm quoting. The other is uh, 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 how to, uh, when and how to give a deferment. Now, Since uh, tax, uh, the tax deficiency question is not relevant, uh, do you happen to know, as a matter of fact, the current tax liability of McDonnell Douglas to the United States of America? No, I don't. Do you, do you think you ought to? We did look into 
a calculation of what McDonnell Douglas was showing in its cash flow as far as taxes owed the government. We did review that as part of the cash flow analysis. I don't recall the precise amount that was in there. I recall that um, uh, there was some indication out of our DCAA that uh, repayment was not timed properly. And no. we did uh, ask them to change that in there, in, uh, or we well, changed it. Let, let me, let me uh, help you here. Suppose I told you that uh, they owed the United States of America a billion dollars in unpaid taxes. Would that stimulate your recollection? I'm sorry, I Not don't really. recall the amount. It wasn't, it wasn't specifically discussed other than the timing yeah. of, of repayment of taxes that they did owe. And, that, did and owe. that's because it is, in, in your view, neither required by the law nor relevant to this transaction, the deferment. The data that we reviewed on the deferment was on their cash flow. To the extent that their cash flow was affected by when they would repay taxes that they owed or pay taxes that they owed, we were concerned with it. We were not concerned um, beyond that uh, on that issue as regards the deferment. Well, d did you know how much stock uh, the IRS uh, holds in the uh, McDonnell, McDonnell Douglas uh, helicopter firm? McDo I'm sorry, I didn't. I missed the last part of your question. McDonnell Douglas. D do you know what the IRS's position in in, in the stock of a McDonnell Douglas helicopter Inc. Do I, I, I don't understand. You, you don't. Do, do you know what the Internal Revenue Service's position is on the stock that's held in the McDonnell Douglas helicopter firm? No, sir, I you do don't. not. Okay. Would you, would you feel that you should know that they hold a lien on all of the stock, 100 percent of it? It's not directly relevant to the decision that we made. Okay. So in other words, if, uh, if this company was, as in certain parts of it, under liens by the uh, IRS for taxes, it would have not. It would not play a, a role in your determining whether there would be a deferment. The fact that they owe substantial amounts of money would be relevant to our analysis, in that they they don't have cash to to uh, right. repay a very large debt of this sort, and and uh, presumably have had similar negotiations with the IRS, of which I was not directly aware. Well, then that would be relevant, wouldn't it? It I mean, how could you make this decision if, if incidentally you need to know uh, what their tax position is, but yet you didn't make that determination here? Sir, the evidence that we had was convincing that they could not repay the debt. We did not need additional evidence that they were unable to repay the debt. So you never contacted the IRS? No, sir, we did not. And you didn't know that uh, their helicopter company had a a lien against it by the IRS. No, I did not. Uh, did you perform an analysis of the change in cash flow due to the cancellation of the A-12 program? Our cash flow included the impact of the cancellation of the A-12 program. The answer is yes? The answer is yes. Okay. And you stated in your presentation on January 30th that earnings for the fourth quarter of 1990 will not result from profits on operations, but will relate to a, quote, pension accounting gimmick, unquote. Recall? Yes, I recall. Okay. What, what did you mean by a pension accounting gimmick? Sir, this data is data that I consider to be proprietary and that I am forbidden by law from discussing in an open hearing, I, I, as I see it. I do not wish to discuss that information, though I will be glad to talk to you about it privately and give you all the answers you want. There's information in that presentation which McDonald considers proprietary and which I believe I have to protect. And, well, and information of the nature that you're reading now is, is in that category, I would say. You mean you can't describe to me what you, you're the one that raised it. Yes, I'm asking I did. you to describe your, your 
characterization of a pension accounting gimmick. Is that proprietary that you the can't define that? The information in that briefing is proprietary. Yes, it is. I didn't ask you for the information. That information in it. is proprietary, I believe. Well, well, what about its publication in the annual report? Is that proprietary? What's published in annual reports is not proprietary. What is in the briefing that I provided, I consider to be proprietary. But it, it's already in the annual report. I, I can't, uh, well, we'll get a copy of the annual report and read it back to you. Uh, uh, everybody that uh, wants to get that information has got it. The, the company couldn't possibly be claiming that's proprietary. It's published publicly. But I'm not even asking for that. I just wanted to know what you meant by a pension accounting gimmick. I'm not asking you for any information inside the report, a public report. Sir, I consider the information you're asking for to be proprietary and to be damaging to McDonnell Douglas, and, and I, I do not wish to discuss it in this open forum. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about the uh, analysis that was done of McDonnell Douglas in connection with the uh, billion dollar loan request uh, after which was uh, some analysis was done uh, of the corporation after the deferment agreement was signed is that true yes uh -huh. and and why was that because we were considering the the concern was that providing the deferment did not provide any cash to mcdonnell that money was already spent that there was concern that McDonnell might need additional cash, and we were looking as to whether the government would provide additional cash to McDonnell Douglas. Uh, well, the, uh, the analysis then was done in support of a request by McDonnell Douglas for a billion dollar loan in the form of advanced progress payments. Is that right? They asked for advance payments, which is somewhat different from a loan, mm -hmm. uh, and it was done, we, we were, doing additional analyses uh, to look at not advance payments but unusual progress payments which is a, a different thing and to whether we would provide unusual progress payments to the company. Thank you. What action has been taken by the Department of Defense in order to help solve the cash flow problems of McDonnell Douglas? We have not taken any additional action uh, since the deferment to solve the cash flow problems of McDonnell Douglas. Okay. Now, uh, without going into specific numbers, which we've avoided doing in respect to the request by McDonnell Douglas, the cash requirement summaries showed a significant difference from the January 11, 91 submission by MDC and your own presentation on January 30. Uh, who caused that change, uh, you or MDC? Sir, I'm reluctant to discuss this information in an open forum on McDonnell Douglas's cash flow, the specifics of which I believe are proprietary information. I have very good explanations for everything you are asking. I promise you that I do. I. I will be glad to talk to you in your office or at a closed hearing. This information is well, sensitive, proprietary information. Wait a minute. We're, we're not asking you to describe the proprietary information. I just said the question I ask is who caused the change? We know there was a change. Now the question is, was it you or MDC? There was information provided to me by McDonald that I had verified by DCAA that caused a change in some of the numbers that I used from the numbers they had provided before. They gave me written indication of the concerns, and I, I presented the numbers as I saw it. The most realistic presentation of them was at that time. Okay, so to avoid any discussions of, of what you claim is proprietary, uh, the change was caused by McDonnell? No, the change was caused by my analysis of information I had received from McDonnell Douglas that I had verified by DCAA. Well, is it true 
that those changes acceler accelerated the cash flow crisis from April to January, thereby making the deferment and the request for a billion dollars even more urgent. Sir, the cash flow crisis never manifested to the extent that we thought that it might. McDonnell took some draconian measures to improve its position, and the cash flow crisis that we thought might occur did not occur. Okay, that, so, that's not the question. Isn't it true that those changes accelerated the cash flow crisis from April to January thus making the deferment and the request for a billion dollars more urgent. The de it had nothing to do with the deferment. It had to do with our consideration of whether to provide unusual progress payments. Okay, let it me try the question. The that, that's urgent. off the, let me, let me just ask the question and you respond. Uh, we'll, we'll get all the other uh, information you want us to know. We'll get it into the record. But this question is, isn't it true that those changes that you say you initiated were acceler that, that accelerated the cash flow crisis of McDonnell Douglas from April to January, thus made the deferment and the request for a billion dollars more urgent? No. It did not? No. Isn't it true that the McDonnell Douglas Corporation requested the deferment to be completed prior to the close of business February 4, 1991, and to precede the company announcement of earnings and a dividend of $150 million on February 5, 1991. Sir, we are getting into areas that are concerning the financial status of a contractor that I'd rather not discuss in an open this is, hearing. This is private information? I believe that it, it is, yes. The, the committee doesn't need to know this? The committee knows it and the committee has it. So does GAO. They have all the information that we have with one document accepted and you know it and you have it. The committee has it. I don't feel free to discuss it in an open hearing. Well, isn't it true that the McDonnell Douglas Corporation sent the department a draft of the deferment agreement that was just about the same as the one that was signed? It was not the same as the one that was signed. They did send us a draft. Well, you, you have the draft and you have the uh, deferment agreement. So what were, what were the differences in I believe them? Mr. McCormick might be better able to address that. I did not negotiate the deferment agreement, sir. It was done by the Navy. And I'm not completely... Well, weren't the terms the same? Sir, I... You I, don't know. I don't recall. They negotiated recall. that agreement. I, I have seen them, and I don't know them by heart. Uh, but I, I believe there were, there were extensive differences between the two documents. But I'm speaking from memory, and I did not negotiate those, that well, document. Will you, for the record, uh, submit to us, after you make an analysis, what those differences were? Sir, I believe that's more appropriately addressed to the Navy. That was their document and their Wait negotiation. Wait a minute. I, I'm just asking mine. you if you would do that, please. Yes, I will do it. Thank you very much. Now, since... Uh, Mr. McCormick, the Navy is supposed to know the difference between the two. Could you assist us on this question, sir? We will give you a comparison of that, Mr. Chairman. As I recall, the primary difference was uh, protective covenants with respect to protecting the government's interest, as well as calling for a review of the financial condition of McDonnell Douglas and this agreement in December of 1992. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well. Let me thank you very much for the uh, responses that you've given me so far. Uh, Mr. Horton, the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'd just I'd like to get a, a couple of things uh, uh, in order here so that we understand what we're talking about. Um, I guess there were some advance uh, payments that had been made uh, to the um, two companies. Uh, uh, in, uh, in connection with the A12 program. Is that correct? No. No? No. There were never any advance payments made. To well, how did they get the $1.3 billion? The $1.3 was made in progress payments. When we terminate for default, we're entitled to get back 
progress payments for which deliveries have not been made, for which items have not been delivered. All of that money was spent. It was not an advance payment. It was the difference between the prices for the delivered items and the incurred cost. Well, let me understand now. Um, what you're saying uh, is that there were payments that had been made and when there was the default uh, or when the uh, contract was canceled by Secretary Cheney, that that money was then due, $1.3 billion. Is that correct? Secretary Cheney did not cancel the contract. The Navy canceled the contract and the amount due back to the government was $1.3 billion. All right, the Navy, uh, Three, five. But, the, but the Secretary made the decision, didn't he? Are you no, telling he me he not. didn't make the decision? No, he did not. The Navy made the decision. Well, that's interesting. Is that right, Mr. McCormick? Uh, Mr. Horton, I was not involved in the uh, deliberations relating to the cancellation of A-12, and uh, I would like to answer that question for you on the record. Uh, I'm not the appropriate person, and I know it's been talked about a great deal. Who is the appropriate person? The contracting officer? Yes. I'm advised it's the contracting officer. Well, I didn't think we were going to have a problem about who canceled the contract. The contract was canceled, was it not? The, the chronology of events was the secretary made a decision not to provide extraordinary contractual relief to the contractors, at which point the Navy terminated the contract for default. The contracting officer of the Navy terminated the contract for default. Congressman Horton, can I inject point here? Yes, Mr. Yaki, help us. I understand that, and I'm trying to get it on the record so the I understand. But the Secretary of Defense did make the decision that he was not going to allow this contract to continue in, in a reformed sense. That left only two options left basically for the Navy, either a termination for convenience or a termination for default. The contracting officer, in deliberation with everyone else, made that determination for a termination for default. Right. Okay. That is the sole duty Thank of the you. contracting that, officer. That sets the stage. Now, um, as a result, there was at that point $1.35 billion owed by these two contractors. Is that correct? Yes. Which were disputed, of course, by the two contractors. Ms. Spector, you work for Mr. Yaki, is that right? And you're That's part of right, his I do. operation. Okay. Yes, I do. All right. Well, now, um, that money was owed the federal government, was it not? We believe it is. The contractors do not believe that it is. Well, we have, a, we have an argument about that. Yes, right? indeed, we do. Sure. Absolutely. That's is is one that of a the lawsuit? Bases. I'm sorry. Did yes. somebody start yes, a lawsuit? Yes, there's a lawsuit. What's the status of that? It's uh, 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 a yeah. um, uh, complaint on behalf of the contractors was filed in April in the claims court. Both contracts? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It's a joint venture. Well, now there came a time when somebody um, in some, either Department of Defense or the Navy, informed these contractors that there was a claim that $1.3 billion was owed. Is that not right? That's correct. How much of the $1.3 billion is owed by, um, uh, by McDonnell and how much is owed by General Dynamics? Uh, the joint venture owes the total amount. They both owe the, t the whole and, and, um, and also um, whatever part that they split up, is that right? Whatever they decide to split up is what they owe. So they both they owe it? Yes, sir. Well, now, um, was General Dynamics part and parcel of the request for the waiver? Yes, they were. Uh, it, it waiver, I'm sorry, is not the deferment. Yes, they were. Or the deferment? Yes, they were. I'm sorry. The word I want to use is deferment. If I say waiver, it means deferment, okay? Okay. <clears throat> there came a time when, when um, somebody requested that. Who requested that, uh, that deferment? Um, the two contractors signed the request. I, I'd have to check the names of the okay. individuals who signed. Now, did you look into, uh, in that connection, uh, for a deferment, as I understand it, there, there are certain restrictions as to when you can and when you cannot defer. Is that correct? Yes. 
Now, what was the basis on which you felt that you could make a deferment here? There were two bases. The amount was in dispute. The fact that it was owed at all was in dispute is, it was one basis. The other is that the contractors were unable to pay uh, the weak financial condition was the second basis. So it was both. Well, now, did you look at the, um, at the financial ability of uh, General Dynamics? Not to the extent we did McDonald, but yes, we looked at both. Well, what was General Dynamics? They could not have afforded to repay, uh, repay the total amount for which they would have been liable had McDonald been What's unable. the basis on which you ba make that statement? Uh, defense Contract Audit Agency reports that we had. And do we have copies of all that yes, sir. information? I believe you do, yes. And then, but you looked at that and you felt that General Dynamics was not able to do that. That's correct. And then you also looked at the McDonnell and you felt that they were not able to do that. That's correct. I just saw I get the sequence. There was a request, for this letter that's up here, uh, from the uh, president of the CEO of McDonnell dated January 24. That was after the Navy canceled for default the contract. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And that was also prior to the time that the um, a waiver or the deferment was granted. Is that yes, correct? Yes, it was. Um, was that unusual? The request? Yes. Yes. What, uh, what um, reaction did uh, you have to that? We were generally concerned with the health, the financial health of the company when we received this, and we had been concerned for several months about the financial health of the company. Well, now, what does all this mean, that little uh, statement up there, that uh, that's your, is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. You're Eleanor. Yes. Uh, attached, it's, it's dated 13191. Is that prior to the time that the decision was made on the deferment? Uh, yes, it's prior to the decision on the, uh, <clears throat> yes, prior to the decision on the deferment. What's your understanding as to who makes the deferment? Who made the decision? The Navy made the decision officially, but it was well understood and well known within the department. It was certainly approved by the Deputy Secretary, and uh, it was a coordinated department agreement that this was the right thing to do. Is there a who or is it a composite? The official <laughs> who is the Navy, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management. Who is that? Mr. McCormick. Oh, he said he did. He said he did. He said the Navy did, I believe is what he said. Oh, but that's, but, but he said it was, he didn't say, I mean, you say he made the decision. Is that what you the said? The official decision is made by him, but I can't, obviously you know, it was well known in the department, it was approved I'm by the I'm not arguing Deputy about that, Secretary. I'm not arguing about anything, I'm okay. just trying to get information. That's what occurred. I mean, all I want to do is find out who made the decision. You say the Navy made it and he's the man who made the decision. Officially, period. that's what occurred, but it was well, di well studied within the department. He signed the paper? Yes, he did. Okay. You made recommendations on it, did you not? I made recommendations to Mr. Yaki and... Mr. Yaki, did, um, did you make the decision? You made well, a recommendation. Did, sir, as I tried to explain earlier. I made a recommendation. And that recommendation was concurred in by every secretary, the Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of the Army, because all of the programs in McDonnell Douglas at the time cut across that board. Now, and is there a piece of paper that says all that? Yes, sir. Where is that? That's one that's been withheld by this committee for the reasons that were cited earlier. Well, which, but in which that... Reason, which reason? Executive privilege? Yes. And that's the one the chairman was referring to. That's but correct. But there is a that's document what like that. If, what was that question? There is a document or a piece of paper. It was the document of recommenda and that's recommendation. What you're not that is correct. Furnishing to this committee. Yeah. That recommendation was concurred in. Okay. And it was nothing what but was a that recommendation, recommendation? And which, which was concurred. What was that recommendation? Say it again. What was that the recommendation? The recommendation was to grant the deferment for to the both reasons. these companies. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last question. To both these companies? Yes, to because it was a joint. Companies. The contract is with a joint venture. The joint venture is a team of McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics. It's a single entity in the contract. Therefore, the request for the deferment is to that contract, to both of those parties who are part of that joint venture. Now, just so I understand the procedure, you made the recommendation, and then the various secretaries made the recommendation. They concurred in my concurred recommendation. Concurred. Yes. Okay. And then 
the Navy made the decision. Is that correct? It's back to that technicality that we were talking about earlier in the contracting officer. The actual implementation of that recommendation was done, of course, by the Navy. Okay. Well, now, what happened, uh, Ms. Uh, Spector, to this uh, request for a billion dollar loan that was made by that letter from um, Mr. O'Donnell dated uh, January 24 to Mr. Yeah, I, I didn't receive a, a request for a billion dollar loan from Mr. McDonald. I received a request to look at advanced payments, which I subsequently denied. And what happened to that? We denied it, and they withdrew their request. Did, did you write a, a letter of denial? I informed him of that verbally, and then I additionally, in a later memorandum which I sent, which I believe you people have a copy of, I informed him of the dramatic actions he would have to take management actions before we would entertain unusual progress payments against the F-18 and the F-15 only, only restricted to those two programs, where we would be assured that the work was already accomplished, and in effect all we would be doing is paying for work that would already owed. We in no circumstance agreed to provide him with any advance payments in any way, shape, or form. I am pleased to say, though, that Mr. McDonald and the McDonald Corporation did listen to some of the, the uh, uh, arguments that we had of what they could do to en enhance their own position, and they did take those actions. And in fact, that is partially responsible for some of the reasons that they are starting to turn around. Now, in the court action, in the was court act Ms. Spector said there's a court action. In the court action, uh, is there uh, a request, and has it been granted, to um, um, prevent the Navy from collecting this money? Uh, may I answer yes, that, sir? Yes, you know. Um, I, I, the court action is questioning whether or not the money is owed at all. They, they don't believe, the contractors do not believe that this is a valid termination for default. They believe it should be a termination for convenience, in which case they would be owed the money. So but the Navy has, with all these recommendations and all the other things, I don't want to go through all that again, but the Navy is claiming that there's a $1.3 billion uh, uh, obligation, is that correct? There's a dispute here. There's a disagreement. Right. We and believe then you it gave the deferment, and how long is that deferment for? Deferment is, is uh, un until an appeal or to be revisited December of 92 uh, for a reevaluation of the uh, financial situation of the two companies. Uh, <clears throat> Is there a criminal investigation uh, into the A-12? Unrelated to what we've right. discussed this morning, I believe there is one ongoing on a different issue. Do you know that too, Mr. Yaki? I'm not aware of it specifically. I've heard that that's true, but I have no knowledge of it specifically. Well, Ms. Spector, uh, what is the status of that, uh, that uh, criminal investigation? I don't know. Who's doing that? Uh, the Justice Department would oh, it's be under the Justice yes, Department. We're generally not privy to all of the actions no, that are taking place that. as a consequence. It of has been referred to justice and justice yeah. make an investigation. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Now, um, <clears throat> have any deferments been made um, either before or after um, with regard to any other company? Yes. Is that normal, usual? Yes. Does that all go through your office? No. Well, how are you so authoritative about it? Uh, it normally is done by the military departments themselves. This one came to our office or was reviewed in our office because of the magnitude, the size of the contracts involved, and the size of the companies involved. We normally do not get involved in deferments. Well, now you just said others have been made. What others uh, are you going um, through now? I believe we furnished a list to the committee. I, all right. I, but you have a list, and, and we do have it. We had to, yes, yes, sir. We had to accumulate it. We don't normally keep those sorts of records at, at my level. Well, They're now, the, 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 uh, the General Accounting Office was somewhat um, uh, concerned about and, and evidenced, at least to us, that they didn't think that you had good documentation and um, sufficient information to make this kind of um, deferment decision. What's your answer to that? My answer is, I think they're drawing a fine line between sufficient documentation and good information. I believe the information is available and we have stacks of it that would lead you, anybody reviewing it to believe we made the right decision. 
There is not a single document that summarizes all of that information. That is also a true statement. But certainly there is sufficient information and documentation and documents available that would say that the Department of Defense may, took the only course of action it could have taken at the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Connecticut, Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I said in the beginning that the, the longer I serve on this committee, the more I feel that there's really not a separation between the DOD and, and the contractors. And I've really been wrestling with what, is the, what are the key issues and where do we have our disagreements. And even if I accept your arguments, uh, I still am left extraordinarily troubled. For instance, um, Ms. Spector, your basis for saying that the, that you followed the regulations for deferment explicitly and so on would, would, would almost give the impression that there was some very explicit things that had to happen. There were some, there are some points that a description of the debt, the date of the first demand for payment, notice of interest, charges, identification, but, but we're focusing on something that, 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 that is not stated under the parts that you think uh, only cover you. We're, we're also applying basic common sense. I mean, the common sense that we're trying to apply is that we have a, a $4.8 billion, up to a $4.8 billion program, 4.4 to 4.8. Uh, we see that, that it was, was canceled because the contractor simply did not live up to his contract, contractors. Uh, we had a payment of $2.7 billion. We feel that we, uh, in, a ses in a sense, overpaid them for what they delivered to us, which were six design packages, no planes, just some parts. So we spent what we think legitimately should have been spent about $1.3.5 billion, but what we got for it is nothing, pretty much. And the companies think they deserve the additional 1.3.5 approximately for their 2.7. And what we now have is nothing, except we're going to go to the AX, and we're even letting McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics apply for the new AX. We think it's going to cost $12 billion. We don't know, you know really how that's going to work out and when and so on. I mean, that's what we have on the surface. Then what we have is the, uh, the first hearing where you came, and you made the implication that there was thorough analysis, and then acknowledged that there was really no documentation. There were a lot of different information pieces that were provided. You have told us that the information that you have gotten was supplied by McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics. Is that correct? Uh, and other sources. Uh, pardon me? And other sources. What are the other sources? DCA, uh, Defense Contract Slow Audit Agency. Slow down a second, please. What were the other sources? Defense Contract Audit Agency, yeah. Defense Contract Management Command, Standard and Poor's, Moody's. Now, pretty much all supplied by the company to Standard and Moore, uh, Moore's and others. Uh, we yeah. got it from all the independent sources that exist right. that analyze financial data of contractors right. that's publicly available. No, but see, <laughs> the, the problem is there's public documents and there's private documents and there's proprietary information which you feel the public doesn't have a right to know and there is a law that basically <coughs> protects them. It's just a definition. Um, one reason why we're getting nowhere is that you are defining proprietary pretty strictly and we can't even comment on your comments about this information. We're not even going to talk about data, but you, you, know, you go into, you know, it's basically taking the fifth except using a, a, different, a different piece of information. My problem is this. Bottom line, McDonnell Douglas wanted to get some information and their financial house in order in a certain kind of way by getting advance payment so that they could go to stockholders and, and, and the investing public and give the impression that they were doing okay when in fact they're telling you they're nearly going bankrupt. And you are a party to, in my judgment, a very serious thing. And that is, on one hand you're saying they're nearly going bankrupt but we can't let the public know about it, it's proprietary, and the other they're going to their investors and paying dividends and saying they're doing fine. And I happen to just have a, a common sense problem with that. And it, it bothers me that my government is a part of that cover up because in essence you have covered it up. Whether you think you did it for the right reasons, you have been involved in allowing the in investing public to think that 
McDonnell Douglas is doing well when you know it's not doing well, at least from your standpoint. It is in serious financial problems. They could go bankrupt. That's insider information. Now, I want to just focus in on the other company. Uh, is it your testimony that both companies are in serious financial trouble? No. Okay, but you gave an advance payment to both, not an, you gave a deferment to both? Yes. So you are saying that one company is not in financial trouble, but you gave a deferment to both. Why? The companies were jointly and severally liable. Yeah. We did not feel either company could repay the total amount, and that if we were to just go to General Dynamics, they could have sued McDonnell Douglas for half of what we ever, of whatever we asked uh, uh, General Dynamics for. Had they done so and McDonnell gone under, they would have been liable for the full amount. We felt they, they could not have repaid the full amount. Okay. The basis for deferment under your category and your, your rules, the ones you're following, the regulations that you narrowly define apply and choose not to feel that, that other regulations apply, and that's something that will be debated. But you're basically, the, the basic uh, regulation you feel applies, deferments pending disposition of appeal may be granted to small business concerns and financially weak contractors with a reasonable balance of the need for the government security against loss and undue hardship on the contractor. So you either have to be a, a, a small business concern uh, or someone who's financially weak contractor. You've testified that one of them was not a financially weak contractor. Why would we give a windfall to a, non, a, to a contractor that was not financially weak? And under what basis do you do it under the regulation? The regulation also contemplates the responsible official may authorize a deferment pending the resolution of an appeal. Yeah. There was an appeal here as well. It was a compounding of both things, the joint and severable liability, and the pending appeal that the amount was actually owed. Okay. Is it it not pos isn't it possible that you could have divided and, and made an agreement that neither side would, you wouldn't hold either side joint and several? Uh, we did not feel that that was... But see, the problem I have is you're talking about $1.3 billion and you chose to give a company that did not have a financial problem approximately $600 million. You made that recommendation. And you tell me you think it's right. But they didn't need the $600 million. They were not in financial problems. They are buying other companies now. Mr. Yaki, you've been shaking your head. I'm happy to have you comment. Because I'm delighted obviously to be here. I'd you like had to a respond role to, play to that in that question, sir. Pardon me? I said I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to respond to those sure, questions. Sure, I would love it. We made a basic fundamental business decision based on the facts that were available to us, and I believe that those were very precise facts, and I believe that a lot of the information that we had made available to us by both those corporations would fall in the category of insider information. There was published reports, including the McDonnell Douglas 19, 1990 annual report that reported negative cash flow. All of the other analysis that was available to us, we had, in addition to Mr. McCormick's extensive background in the financial community, we had other people within the department available to us. We've been working this problem since June of the prior year. We knew it was coming. We saw it. We had DCA audits. We had every bit of information you can possibly have. And I would like to say this, in addition to those briefings, those were extensive briefings and an awful lot of conversation took place. Now, I'm I think it's morally wrong. I think it's morally wrong for you all to make a decision and not be able to show us a document, a, a document that summarizes all the facts. I think it's an outrage. We have given you, you know, a confirmation of every I piece think of it's document an outrage. you have. I think it's an absolute outrage that you cannot show the American people and us a document that justifies this decision. We instead have shown saying, the GAO, GAO saying, a finished. documentation, a I'm series of documents, finished. and you they made the same conclusion we did. I am not finished then you'll have your chance. I happen to think it's an outrage that you do not have a document that shows this decision so that we have to send GAO hunting for a lot of documents to see if maybe you considered those documents. I think it's an outrage that we aren't able to see a document. I think it's pathetic that you would rely on one part of the regulation when common sense would say that outside sources should also do some checking. And I guess we better prescribe the type of documentation, how many pages, what length, how much, what weight. You know, we get proposals that we could fill this room with. We could also do the same thing on the analysis of this report, which has still come up with the same fundamental conclusion. Mr. How Yaki, far do you have to go? Sorry. Mr. I mean, if, 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 if a paraplegic came in his room and said he mm -hmm. wanted to enter the Boston Marathon, do I need a medical report to prove to me that he can't make it? 
Mr. Yaki? There's a point in time that you've got to say enough is enough. No, no, no. You're wrong. You are in charge of the acquisitions. You are the most important person in this whole process. You're not an underling. You are the man in charge. And you have to provide documentation that can be seen and read and reviewed, not have us hunt for it. And your analysis, uh, analysis of, of, of someone who comes in who obviously can't run a marathon is not acceptable analysis or analogy. That's I, not acceptable. I intend fully. Yeah. In, the, in the fulfillment of my responsibilities to fully comply with the laws of this land. See, the if, if the laws is, of this land require specific documentation, we can, you can rest assured we will provide it. No, but we don't and want to. We will put to together, if you would wish, no. all of the analysis that we've done, and we will, in fact, put it in documentation form to support their conclusions. No, but see, it's, it's an excuse, it, it's an outrage to have it after the fact. And you and your position should know better. You should. And we shouldn't even have, have to be dealing with this problem. You should be able to give us. This is the document, and this, then we can an, analyze it and make a determination of whether you came to a proper one. When you made the deferment, does that become a, a public decision instantly? I mean, uh, what, what's the process? When you make a deferment, do you send a letter to the press? Do you, do you notify us? How do we know about There was a press release. There was a press conference. Uh, Are you legally required to tell people? No. Okay, so you could come back to us and say, under the regulations, we had no right to even tell you, members of Congress and the American people? It's publicly available information. Everything the department does in no, terms of contractual action. No, ma'am, please, please, don't, don't tell me everything the department yeah. does is public information. Because there are a lot of things that were not public information. Let's get to uh, some of them. Uh, uh, yeah. Please, if I may. Sure. I wasn't finished. Sure, I'm sorry. The contractual actions that we take are public information, by and large, with certain few exceptions for security. This and was public proprietary information. information and so on. This was certain information. This was information on which we issued a press release the day or the day after we did it. Um, we had a press conference on it. It was very public information. What's the matter? Yeah, happy to yield. This is on another point, but uh, one that I meant to ask you about. Um, you indicated that there were really two bases for the uh, deferment. One was the uh, financial condition of the two companies, and the other, you said, was because the claim was in dispute. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Was that basis made in the recommendations? In other words, was that basis, that second basis, that the claim was in dispute, was that set forth in the um, recommendations as they went to the Navy and signed off by all the secretaries? Uh, it was a condition for the deferment. Uh, we knew I it mean, was, was it enunciated in, in the document or whatever the It document? was enunciated in certain documents, yes. Yes, I mean, it was, it was uh, enunciated that the contractors did not believe that, the, uh, that they pl did plan to appeal. We were aware of that, the Navy was aware of it, and we were aware of it. Is that, is that language or something to that effect uh, in the document which is being withheld because of executive privilege? Uh, my lawyer advises me, yes. I'd have to reread it. Okay. But, All right. Uh, That's okay. I, I'm advised, yeah. yes. You've been advised that it is in there. Okay. Yes. Um, what's the basis um, for um, a deferment uh, because the claim is in dispute? Is that in the... Um, yes, it is. It says... Um, Although the existence of a contract or appeal of the debt does not of itself require the government to suspend or delay collection action, the responsible official shall consider whether deferment of the debt collection is advisable to avoid possible overcollection. The responsible official may authorize a deferment pending the resolution of appeal. What, uh, what are you reading from there? I'm reading from Federal Acquisition Regulation 32613, Deferment of Collection. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Yaki, I'd like to, uh, to ask a question of you um, in regards to the letter that was sent to you by John McDonald. On the second paragraph, it said, in accordance with the provisions of FAR 32.403F, McDonald Douglas requests that an advanced payment pool arrangement be established to assist in the financing of key programs for the U.S. government, specifically programs proposed for inclusion in the pool or designated pool contracts are F-15, F-A-18, AV, AB aircraft, Apache helicopter, the USA AFT Delta rocket production, Tomahawk, a harpoon missile, the C-17, the C-17 as well, 
and the T45 and so on. We request the advance payment pool in the amount of one billion be established for a period of two years to accomplish this financial objective. A special bank account will be established at the Chase Manhattan Bank if required. This letter was withdrawn? Uh, yes, this letter was withdrawn, but specifically we told uh, uh, McDonald that we would not anticipate uh, 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 entertain, I should say, um, any advance payments. And rather we would look at whatever possibilities may exist in a usual progress payments on specific programs uh, that were well uh, uh, underway, such as the F-15, the F-18. We made specific reference right. to those but two. But they, they had, the, by, they were, at the same time they were asking for the deferral of 1.3, of which they would share, they were also going in with this request as well. No, I don't understand that question. Would you repeat, At the same please? time, they were seeking a deferral of 1.3, uh, as a separate action. Yes, they did. Billion. They were also going in for another billion. They weren't shy about doing th these kinds of things. Rejected that. No, but we weren't shy in telling them no either. Okay. Well, I wonder. I wonder how shy you were. I'd like to uh, to ask, um, okay. uh, Ms. Spector, uh, about the letter that you wrote to Herb uh, Len Lenes. Uh, how do I say his name? He's the uh, chief financial officer. Lenice. That's the letter right up here. It says, attached are the assumption we would like you to use and a revised cash flow analysis. Please have it for us when you come in Thursday if you have any questions. Did they come in with a revised cash flow? Yes, they did. Okay. Now, attached to that was a document, Assumption for Pro Forma Financial Forecast, which I think is right there. It says, assume lot three negotiations will be completed by the end of February 1991. Now, we had GAO, you, you seem to refer uh, very comfortably that GAO was satisfied that the deferment was proper. But uh, the GAO uh, found, uh, when Mr. English questioned them, that this was a pretty shocking disclosure to McDonald and said it could, uh, uh, it could um, in fact, uh, uh, it does kind of smell. Um, the, uh, excuse me, sir, I don't understand that. The question I want to ask you is, uh, you then say, upon completion of Lot 3 negotiations, assume an additional $338 million will be added to the existing Lot 3 long lead document to cover termination liability incurred until a signed contract is executed. Then you say, upon completion of Lot 3 negotiations, assume an additional $52 million. And then you go down further and you say, assume that on June 1st, 1991, an additional $200 million will be obligated against FY91 funding profile for R&D. As a result of this obligation of an additional $200 million in FY91, the FY92 funding requirement will be reduced by an equal amount. And then you talk about $180 million will be obligated in Lot 4 long lead, which is really a slush fund. Uh, that adds up to about $770 million. How, how far have you proceeded along, along that line? Sir, I think there is a gross misunderstanding of what this document is. Uh, okay. An absolute misunderstanding of what this is. McDonnell Douglas had come in with a cash flow analysis that we felt was too optimistic. We were concerned with some of their assumptions. Right. One of their assumptions was that on the C-17, as they build, they would get paid. What these assumptions tell them is they will not get additional money on, that pro on the various contracts until certain dates. Right. And they were spending money in advance of being paid on these programs. They were advancing the government money, if you will, and spending money for which they were not being reimbursed. And for their cash flow to indicate they would be was too optimistic. So we were telling them, do not expect additional money on, on the C-17 until certain dates. You may expect to get additional money. These were contracts that were not fully funded. Okay, let me just go down then very quickly. Uh, the C-17, Lot 3, February 91, 338 million, did they receive that? I don't know whether they received any of these. I, I do not know whether any of this was received. This was a hypothetical that do not expect to get reimbursed dollar for dollar of, of what you spend or even get progress payments on some of what you spend you, you, until these dates. Your I, testimony is your testimony is they have not received this I money or you do not, not know. know. Why not? 
because it is not something we followed through on after we suspended doing their cash flow analyses based on the, uh, for the deferment. So I do not know whether they, these were ever fulfilled. They were assumptions. Excuse me. I'm going to conclude, but I'm very puzzled by this. You're telling me that we're talking about $770 million of money, and you cannot t tell me whether they've received this money or not? No, sir, I cannot. This is Air Force action. This was Air Force data given to me on when the Air Force plan to provide funding so that progress payments could be paid on these contracts. And it's your testimony that this basic document is, is, is therefore irrelevant? It's not. It's irrelevant to the discussion of whether or not they got unusual progress payments. It was part of that analysis. But whether or not they ultimately got these amounts, we did not go back and check because, in fact, we suspended doing our analysis to provide unusual progress payments. So all this was was a list of assumptions for, for cash flow because the company itself was showing assumptions that we considered possibly were too optimistic. But if in fact they received that amount of money, they would have gotten three quarters of what they were looking in the one billion. No, sir. This has nothing to do whatever with that. This was money to pay them back for money they had spent on the C-17 yes. that we had not reimbursed because we had not provided sufficient money for long lead time on the C-17. So basically you're saying you didn't provide sufficient money so you, you, you wanted to speed up the process? They were entitled to this money. I know they're entitled to it, but that's the problem. So they don't get the $1 billion, so they get it this way. This is that's money. The, that's no, the sir, way it looks to me. That's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. The $1 billion they asked for was advance payments in advance of spending it on all their programs. That's what they asked for. But instead you did this. We did not do this in any way, shape, or form related to that. This is unrelated. This is money fact, that was sold. Thank, thank you. I'll, I'll yield back. <coughs> I, I recognize for our, our final a member today, Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Spector, I uh, want to read to you a little bit from uh, the 1990 annual report, McDonnell Douglas. Uh, and this is on page 45 over in the second column. And it states that MDC has entered into agreements with two major insurance companies to purchase single premium annuity contracts on a, on a participating basis to provide certain benefits for approximately 37,000 retired participants in MDC's salaried and hourly pension plans. The purchase of the annuity contracts constitutes a settlement under SFAS number 88. No plan asserts, uh, excuse me, no plan assets revert to uh, MDC and no cash was received by MDC uh, as a result of these uh, transactions. Uh, does that sound like a gimmick to you? That is McDonnell Douglas' statement of what they did. I assume it was audited. I didn't ask you that. I asked you, does that sound like a gimmick to you? If it's to show earnings on, 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 uh, on operations of a company, it is not earnings on the company's operations. If they show earnings on the basis of that, it would be earnings on, on adjustment of a pension plan, not on company operations. It would be a gimmick then? I don't choose to characterize it that way. Well, how do you choose to characterize it? I, as, I, as I stated in the prior answer to your question. Do you care, did you, have you characterized it in the gimmick in the past? Sir, the information that I provided in confidence to my supervisors is not information that should be discussed in this open forum on this subject. Well, I, I guess I've got a problem, Inspector, whenever we've got the 1990 annual report, when McDonnell Douglas puts it out in their own report for the whole world to see, stockholders, anybody that wants it, that's not proprietary information. They are the ones, and I read you their quote, their quote, their words, in their report characterizing this maneuver. I ask you, is that a gimmick? Sir, may I say something here? Sure. Things I say at this hearing can have a very serious effect on McDonnell Douglas's ability to get financing from the banks, which they're seeking right this moment, and, ha and can have serious impact on uh, some short sellers who are very eager to see the stock go down because of adverse financial news. I am not eager to harm the company in either of those ways by damaging their ability to get financing or by appeasing some short sellers who are very eager to get bad news. Now, 
I'm a, an official of the Department of Defense, and for me to characterize something they're doing appropriately in their financial statement as a gimmick is not something appropriate for this hearing, and I, I do not wish to characterize it in that way, nor do I. Well, Ms. Spector, I, I'm sorry that you feel that way about it. Certainly, I don't know of anyone on this committee that, that, worse, uh, that uh, wishes McDonnell Douglas any kind of harm. But I wish think it or not, some of the statements that are being released here at this hearing are causing that harm. Would Whether you, you wish it or not, you, uh, you, you... Look, it's a little difficult for you to tell us, uh, first of all, uh, what's, what this is going to do. We, we've, we've got as many lawyers or more than you. And the, the question that the gentleman from Oklahoma is asking about gimmick is your language. He didn't invent it. We're not... It's not his characterization, Mrs. Spector. It's yours. It's information. For you to deny it now is a little bit after the fact, and I, I think it begs the question, and I'd ask the gentleman to, to move on so Sir, we can wrap this up. Sir, it is information up. that our lawyers denied being available for release at this hearing in a public hearing. Well, it is there's some more information that your lawyers are, are not eager to give up that we, that we will use the process for uh, to, to get. I mean, you know, this is not a matter of my opinion and the Department of Defense as to what materials are, are available to us. It's a matter of law and procedure, and that's all we're doing. And, Ms. Spector, I'd, I would point out <coughs> I simply read to you the characterization by McDonnell Douglas that they published for the public. I gave you my and, answer. And I ask you simply if that was, in fact, in your opinion, a gimmick. It's I my asked, opinion. You know, simply wanted a yes or no answer. I, uh, you know, I, I think we got our answer, Ms. Spector. Um, but uh, you know, I think the bottom line, too, I would suggest to you, while you, I can certainly appreciate that I you no one in this room wishes mcdonnell douglas ill we also have a primary responsibility as officials of the united states government to the taxpayers and in this particular situation there are some very serious questions that have been raised as to whether or not the taxpayer has been well served now uh, uh, mr yaki uh, made uh, uh, the point that these were business decisions that were made and I've got to say that that concerns us somewhat. Were these business decisions being made for business or were these decisions that were made to benefit the taxpayer? And that's what we've got some serious questions about. That's what this whole hearing is about. And I would think you would take note of the fact that these concerns and questions are being raised not just by one side of the aisle in the Congress, but by both sides. Republicans and Democrats alike are raising these questions with you folks. And I would hope that, uh, that you would take it seriously. Now, I do have some additional questions, I, and I hope that you will give us candid, honest answers to them. Now, the issue with regard to the letter that was sent on January the 24th by Mr. John McDonald uh, to Mr. Yockey, as it makes this uh, the, the uh, statement in here, advanced payment pool arrangements. Twice that this statement is made, advanced pool arrangements. And uh, the amount of $1 billion was raised. Now, according to the General Accounting Office and their characterization, they may could characterize no difference between what an advanced payment pool arrangement was and a loan. From their, the way that they characterize it, from what they knew, there is no difference. That is a loan. Now, that, the thing that troubles us a good deal is that seven days later, seven days after this request for a billion dollar loan we have your personal note to uh, uh, right to herb uh, lanice herb lanice signed eleanor in which you uh, were making these requests that uh, that they revise uh, the analysis and the, the assumption or revise the uh, cash flow analysis and change the assumptions that were made basing it on the assumptions that uh, that you uh, uh, laid out now that timing troubles us a good deal seven days and that's carrying through a weekend so basically we're talking about five work days later after this request was made by Mr. McDonald for a billion dollar loan, we have some very favorable assumptions that you forwarded 
uh, at your, and uh, these assumptions were things that evidently haven't come to pass. Uh, Ken, uh, I'll ask you the question. Uh, with regard to um, uh, the aircraft that were mentioned, the two aircraft, uh, were they, was the T-1 delivered in June? I don't know. You don't know whether it was? No. Then I've how could you, you what, let, me, let me ask you the question yeah. then. What about the P-2? Would it be I delivered in December? I don't know. Now, I guess then the thing I would ask you is, if you don't know now whether or not the assumptions that you were urging be considered were in fact came to pass and became fact, how could you request that the assumptions be made in the first place? Sir, these were used as, as more negative assumptions in a cash flow analysis than the company itself we thought was making. They gave us a cash flow analysis. We wanted to be sure that that analysis had the latest government planning information on when things would occur. This, we think, was a more pessimistic set of assumptions than the company was using. We said, use zero claim recovery. We said, these were assumptions. They were not prognostications. But these they were our best guess at the time of when certain funding would be provided that the company was entitled to. My understanding, it was signed on March the 3rd, which turns out, interestingly enough, to be a Sunday. <clears throat> there may oh, be an error in that regard. It may, uh, there may have been additional long lead time funding provided, which would have been appropriate because the contractor was continuing to perform and what required was, additional funding. What was not appropriate, though, was the fact that you were stating in the assumptions that were being laid out that, in fact, that this contract was going to be negotiated by the end of February. That, as Sorry. I went through, if I may, as Sorry. I went through, could I complete my point? <clears throat> as I pointed out to the general accounting office, this gives a, a substantial benefit to the other person on the other side of the negotiating table. No, it does not. Well, I'm sorry. GAO seemed to agree with me that it did. GAO appeared to be unfamiliar with what the implications of this document were, sir. Well, and the fact is it did not give any sort of a negotiation advantage to anybody. It was a, a guess at the time of when additional long lead time money would be provided. That guess was predicated on the conclusion of negotiations occurring. It said, we'll provide more money when you conclude negotiations. Meanwhile, they were performing on their own nickel. They were spending their own money up until then till we provided more money, which was putting them deeper and deeper in a, into a cash flow problem. So but we said, we'll provide this money on this date. That's what it said, assuming negotiations are concluded. That's all it said. It was a list of assumptions. There's no cash pool here. There's no loan there. I, I mean, your, your understanding of this is not correct. Well, evidently, it's not just my uh, lack of understanding, Ms. Spector. It's evidently the General Accounting Office and uh, most of the members of this committee. In fact, the way it appears, you seem to be the only one who has a good understanding of exactly what has happened here. And that seems to be selective uh, uh, in part. Uh, certain areas uh, that you don't want to discuss certain items you have no information about, such as uh, the T1 and the P2, which you're asking other people to make assumptions on. And uh, the simple fact of the matter is, uh, as Mr. Horton has uh, pointed out, that uh, we have a company that uh, evidently their financial standings improved substantially. At least somebody knows something as far as the stock market's concerned because their stock is selling at an all-time high. Now, something is fishy here, Ms. Spector. That's the reality of this whole matter, and that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. And uh, I've got to say that, uh, you know, the lack of, of candor that we've had from you with regard to certain items hasn't helped. Uh, that's the way it is. You know, the, the reality is that we have a request from McDonnell Douglas for a loan for a billion dollars. We have seven days later a note coming from you, which, uh, in fact, uh, makes, favor makes assumptions which, bottom line, could benefit this company by nearly... 750 billion, or excuse me, 750 million dollars, which is getting pretty much in the neighborhood with regard to what the original loan was. We find that the contract was in fact complete, very close to the date in which you had within your assumptions. So all of this added up raises some very serious questions as to whether or not uh, you were more concerned about looking after McDonnell Douglas or looking after the taxpayer. And that's the bottom line, Inspector. I'm sorry if 
in fact, uh, you don't like that particular characterization, but that's the way it looks on the surface. The characterization is wrong. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we do have uh, some other questions, Ms. Spector, that I would ask that, uh, that you uh, the answer. You uh, directed uh, Ms. Spectres, were, were the assumptions that we have up here on the board, were those assumptions put forth in order for the Department of Defense to try to arrive at a decision on whether to make a billion dollar loan or not? No. <coughs> the cash flow statements had nothing to do with that. We never thought about providing a billion dollar loan. With regard to the assumptions that you put forth, tied to the contracts that were eventually negotiated in which, according to McDonnell Douglas, was signed on Sunday, March the 3rd, did McDonnell Douglas benefit substantially from that contract and that agreement and from those assumptions? No. They have not benefited in any way. They have not benefited from those assumptions in any way. Did they change the cash flow in any way? They changed their cash flow analysis on the C-17 based on those assumptions and on the T-45 based on the assumption that I gave them. They changed their cash flow projections that they gave us. I don't know if their internal ones changed they were doing it for us so we could see how it looked. I don't know if their internal cash did, flow cha uh, uh, predictions changed. Did you rely on those changes? R rely for what? We didn't make any decision based on them. There was nothing based on them. There so no, we did not rely on them for any decision that was made by the department. There have been no decisions that have been made based on those, uh, on that, uh, uh, on that uh, cash flow. The information that, that came in on this, for this data came in after the deferment. There has not been a decision regarding McDonnell Douglas cash flow since that time. And no decision based on McDonnell Douglas cash flow? Not since that time, not a decision to provide them anymore, let's put it that way. There's been a decision not to provide them additional money. Uh, when the question arises, you know, what was the purpose of those assumptions? We were trying to analyze, to enhance further the analysis that we were doing of cash flow problems that they might be having. You directed that um, after the negotiations uh, were concluded that McDonnell Douglas Company should uh, assume large sums uh, would be uh, added to the long lead account for lots uh, three and four. Was that done? I don't know. You also directed that a change in assumptions for May and June of more large sums be added to other accounts for the C-17. Have these been done? I don't know. You'll have well, to ask those questions to the Air Force. This was Air Force contract management that we were dealing with. It was when the Air Force planned to provide increments on an incrementally funded contract. What was the planned source of the funds? The plan source was the uh, was the budget for the C-17. Ms. Spector, I, I, the, the difficulty is that, that you're asking people, as I pointed out before, you're asking people to make assumptions, make changes, make adjustments about things that you tell us that you have no information about. You don't know whether it's been done. You don't know whether, it, it, you know, what was done with the information. No decision's been based on that information. And that's very hard to believe. You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. Sir, I, 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 I'm, 
obviously not making myself clear. These were assumptions for cash flow projections, for predictions. They were assumptions we asked the company to, to make for cash flow predictions. We subsequently decided, and we were going to use those predictions to see how severe the cash flow problem was, and we wanted to be sure the latest government planning was in there. Whether these plans came out, I work for OSD and I, I handle hundreds of different actions in, in a week. The fact was we suspended the analysis that we were doing in great detail because we did not provide a, a advance payments, unusual payments, or any, uh, any unique payments to McDonnell Douglas. These were assumptions. We ultimately decided not to provide additional money. Whether the Air Force <coughs> carried through on these predictions, I, I don't know. I didn't go back and check. It is checkable. I can certainly provide you the information, point by point by point by point, of what was provided and when. If you'd like to know that, it was perfectly legitimate. It would withstand any audit by GAO or anybody else. There is nothing unusual or irregular here. You're, you're picking on something that is not unusual, is not... Uh, this is the way you do business. I Could can, I uh, ask my I, colleague I, I, from I Oklahoma... I can elaborate on that, some of the that actions I, that, that have I'm happened sorry. since this day. Excuse me, Mr. Secretary. Uh, could I ask him to conclude at his earliest convenience? I just uh, have one question, one final question, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Spector, what was the purpose? The purpose was so we could analyze their cash flow to determine if it was sufficiently negative and they had insufficient bank resources to, to borrow money to pay it and whether the U.S. government needed to, to assist the contractor with unusual progress payments on programs that would have been continuing. Which basically brings us back to the point that one way or the other, McDonnell Douglas needed either through a loan or through an outright grant from the federal government nearly a billion dollars. And that's what this was all about. No, it was not. Well, that's the that's way it looks. That's not what this was about. And that's that your, final, your last statement, that's what I interpreted it to say. They had to have the money to keep going, and that was the decision of the Department of Defense. Found a way to funnel it to them. Sir, this money was not funneled to them. This was money we owed them on the C-17. It was money we owed them to perform those contracts. It was not unusual money. It was money they were owed to fund long lead time activities, advanced activities on the C-17. All we were saying is you can plan to receive that money in these months. That's all we were saying. If you, and you're, you may have to carry those programs at your own expense until you get that money. That's all this was saying, to please plan for that in your cash flow, that you may not get repaid on time. This was a negative for the company, not a positive. It was saying you will not get money necessarily when you need it on the C-17. You'll get it on, plan to get it at certain times. That's all it was. We can answer when each of these things occurred. It's auditable. It, it's legitimate. It, 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 it was a set of assumptions. That's all it was. So we could look at their cash flow. Thank it you. didn't provide them a penny. Thank you. Zero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, for one comment or one question, the gentleman from Connecticut. I just will make the comment to you that we will be going into the C-17 this fall, uh, and, and, and there's no doubt from anyone who's looked at it that we have serious problems with the program. I think you will acknowledge there are problems with the program. Is that not much? Right, Mr. Yaki? Yes, we are having problems. So the, the payment schedules and when you decided to pay are, are clearly open to interpretation. But I just, I just um, Ms. Ms. Spector, I, I've been trying to wrestle with just an attitude that says that somehow what you say will have tremendous impact on a company. And that's a terrible burden for you to have, and we put you in an unfair situation. If, in fact, you carry this incredible amount of influence over the stock market in this company. But if you do, what, what that must say is that if you feel that way, then how do you get, how do you answer this question? If you think the company has done something wrong, you think it has done something wrong, but you're also a player in trying to prop it up, which you are, then how do you decide what the public has a right to know? Because the bottom line to this, as far as I'm concerned, is that we've artificially helped this company uh, and, and gone out of our way to, 
And there are stockholders who don't realize it's in the financial problem it's in. And so I guess it works both ways. I mean, people get hurt on both sides, don't they? I mean, if you say one thing, um, some investors benefit, you say another, some other. So isn't it just the best thing to do is to tell the truth and say whatever it is. If they're doing a gimmick, then it's a gimmick. If it's not, it's not. But doesn't it, don't you, don't you feel that, that whatever it is, you should just say the truth, whatever it is? Yes. Okay, so if the company has done something wrong, is it your job to keep it quiet? No. And to only have it be internal? It, no. when you Okay. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know where that... I don't believe the company has done anything wrong, Mr. Shays. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Thank John. you. We'll leave on that word. Let, let me uh, <clears throat> just point out that, it, uh, that the uh, Undersecretary of Defense was uh, under proposed actions going to adjust unusual payments to provide minimum financing needs for McDonnell Douglas. Correct, Mr. Under, Mr. Undersecretary? I don't believe that's the correct statement. Would you repeat it again to make sure I understand what you just said? Yes, yeah, that the Undersecretary of uh, Defense for Acquisition will adjust unusual payments to provide minimum financing needed. We didn't say we would. We said we'd look at it. No, I said will. I, I, wish, I wish it did say that. I'd feel a lot better. Where's the quote coming from? Well, it, it, came, it came from Mrs. Spector's presentation on January 30th. Well, well I'm not privy. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't answer it. Okay. But at no time did we ever have in mind that we would do anything. I we, see. What we did agree to, we would look at. But I rejected out of hand any advance payments. I, I and hope the only so. thing we'd look at to see if there is anything that was potentially possible yes. under unusual progress payments under specific programs that we knew that they could perform mm -hmm. on. That uh, if they did go in bankruptcy, the probabilities they would continue to perform because those programs were profitable, and we would only pay only pay up to that which was d was due them for work accomplished. Okay. Period. Uh, Mrs. Spector, do you remember this statement? I recall the statement, sir. This is one of the documents that I would prefer to discuss with you in private. Uh, this presentation that I gave, I recall it well. Okay. It was a plan at the time. Uh, that, that's all I'm asking, if you recall. I don't want to go into detail. It. I'm trying to close down the hearing, so the answer I interpret to be yes. I think that's what you said. Now here, uh, as we close, I just want to point out the contradiction that has been raised by the gentleman from Connecticut repeatedly. We, we've got in one picture a, a bankrupt procurement firm needed uh, vitally for the national security interest, and we have its chief financial officer uh, quoted this week boasting that his profitability in defense contracts are such that he expects to make 11 billion to 12 billion dollars on defense contracts over the next five years. Now, if that doesn't disturb you, it disturbs me. And uh, that is the nature of the problem. And I, I hope, uh, Mr. Secretary Yaki, that we will look very carefully at the direction we're going on the C-17 contract in terms of uh, funding and the contracting provisions. Uh, that concludes this hearing. I thank you for the time that you've put in, and the subcommittee stands in adjournment. That concludes our coverage of this hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security. For more information on these proceedings, you can write to the subcommittee at B373 Rayburn House Office Building here in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. Here is a reminder now to be with us in about 45 minutes from now when we will bring you a portion of Monday's session of the United States Senate. You will see the senators debating President Bush's recommendation to extend most favored nation trade status to China.
and you will discover why the issue has become one of the most controversial topics on Capitol Hill. That's tonight beginning at 7.05 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.05 p.m. Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN 2. First Recently, C-SPAN's Viewer Information Department received this programming suggestion. I rise in strong support of your network and its fine coverage of our political process. But even though...